One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Tuesday, May 15th meeting of the Weathersfield Planning and Zoning Commission. Would the uh, clerk help me with the roll call, please? Uh, Chairman Harley. I'm here. Vice Chairman Margiotta. Here. Clerk Roberts is here. Mr. Hughes. Not here. Mr. Oichel. Here. Mr. Hammer. Here. Mr. Homicki. Not here. Mr. Dean. Here. Mr. Allard. Here. Mr. Edwards. Here. Ms. Antoniak. Here. Mr. Silva. Here. All righty, so that makes 10 of us. Uh, Mr. Edwards did uh, offer to sit out on this one because he wasn't part of the last um, effort, so we appreciate that. So everybody else is participating in the vote. Uh, item 3.1, a public hearing for application number 1978-18-Z, Franklin Wellness Center, LLC, seeking a special permit in accordance with section 5.11, medical marijuana dispensary facilities of the Weathersfield Zoning and Regs to operate a medical facility. Would you come up, medical marijuana facility? Would you join us, please? Uh, for those of you in attendance, let me go over the rules of a public hearing real quickly. We'll have the applicant discuss the proposal with us. We'll ask some questions when we're reasonably comfortable with what we're hearing. We're going to turn and ask for input from the public. At some point, uh, when we're done hearing from everybody in the public, we will make some determination as to whether we feel comfortable that we have all the information that we think we need. Uh, and if so, we will close the public hearing and then proceed to deliberate and then uh, take motions. All righty, that's how the process works. Is the applicant ready to uh, start a dialogue with us? If you read office, Hado, applicant, Jim Sikonchik, art engineer, and site, um, site engineer. I'm sorry, what was your name again? Uh, it's James Sikonchik, and I will give a card. Thank you. Good evening. As a way of introduction, I am a professional engineer and a licensed land surveyor, and I've been doing site planning at Kratzer Jones and Associates since 1976. I've been president of the firm since 1988 and been involved in many uh, applications and certainly for things that need high security like banks, pharmacies, and other uh, such things. Uh, I would like to uh, first show where this site is. I would like to discuss what exists within a thousand foot radius of the site. And I would like to discuss some of the characteristics of the site, the site's geometry, access, and put those kind of issues on uh, the record. Might be better to put it over on this side just so, whole, so we can see it better. Yeah. Um, Try to keep it high. Does this look like it? Okay. All right. Everybody? Good to go. Good to go. Good. Sure. All right. <clears throat> and then the trick is to be able to be heard at the same time. Um, there is an existing uh, commercial building on uh, Silasine Highway owned by the Mazacato family. <clears throat> uh, this building currently has a bank key bank right over here and certainly a bank is a type of institution that needs security protocols. <laughs> they, they've got money and they've been there a long time. They've been successful there. Uh, in the past, not the recent past, but in the past there was a pharmacy on this site and they too had uh, security uh, issues. And certainly going up and down Silasteen Highway, there are 
pharmacies the c v s type places which is certainly have opioids and other prescription drugs that are very security conscious issues and they too have successfully been able to manage that so this proposed health care facility which would be in the middle of the building would be no different in the type of security concerns they would have in terms of keeping the product in a safe they're going to be putting in a twelve foot by twelve foot engineered safe it's a package you buy and place in there and later we'll talk about some of the internal security electronic security type things that would be used while we have this up the main highway Silas Dean is here you have Wells Road collector street there's a traffic light right here and I'd like to point out that on the side road over here there's a retaining wall the retaining wall goes down this back of the property and there's a great elevation here too what I'm pointing out is the physical geometry of the site creates an isolation kind of a separation between the residential neighborhood in the back and the commercial uh, property it's impossible for anybody to have reasonable access uh, through the back because there is a change of elevation there is a retaining wall uh, and an offense so you know there is there's more isolation vertically uh, that and security wise that exists that uh, we would like to uh, point out now separate from the type of approval we need from this board this is a highly regulated uh, a business like a bank like a pharmacy and there are all types of security protocols and other agencies that we have to show our operation can meet those requirements uh, for example we have displayed here the electronic uh, security by one of the um, uh, motion detectors and, and there's somebody here who will discuss that but I'm simply pointing out that this is part of what we have to do in, in, in any kind of business like this it's not unique a pharmacy would do the same <clears throat> my name is Scott Stevenson and I'm uh, the specialist to uh, develop the surveillance plan for this location um, there's gonna be a total of 16 cameras um, plus any additional cameras that are required uh, via the state. Um, the system is uh, going to have 40 terabytes of storage, um, 30 days of continuous 24 hour video has to be maintained. There is not, the system is not permitted to be only motion activated. So it has to be continuous 24 hours a day. There will be no break in coverage. Um, that system has to be located in a secure facility or a lo secure location inside the building no one would have access to that other than the owner of the property or the state at any time should they wish to gain access to it and of course the video would be made available to any law enforcement officials that required it the cameras are four megapixel cameras um, just slightly short of 4k resolution so we'll basically grab any detail whatsoever and then there's the second oh yeah um, facial recognition is at the, the entrance so there would be facial recognition on it and then also in the exterior of the building there will be license plate registered cameras that would get any plates of any vehicles that entered the premises uh, to access the building um, there is a number of 360 cameras that are located inside the premises as well and these 360 cameras um, I don't know if anybody's familiar with them, but you would see them as they, they almost look like a dome when you're looking at them on the screen. And then when you click on them, they de-warp and you have the ability to be able to scan all around. So 
basically this location is going to have 100% coverage. The only time there is no coverage, and that's via HIPAA, is going to be where the pharmacist would be doing any consultation with um, patients. And uh, is there any questions? Yeah, what happens when the electricity goes out? Uh, the system is on backup, and the state requires that we're going to probably have that's something that the state would discuss, but at least probably 24 hours of continuous backup coverage. And that's via UPS, and uh, that's a large batteries in the bottom. That will power the cameras, as well as the alarm system, as well as the network to be able to maintain total coverage. Um, I'm curious about the operation of the cameras as well as the motion sensors. Sure. Um, with regards to the camera operation, um, is there any way of, of turning them off? Uh, uh, since I know they're supposed to be on 24 hours a day, is there any way that, that all the cameras would go off at once by flipping of some switch or circuit or something? The, like the, 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 the NVR um, has dual power supplies on it. So there's redundancy of power supplies on it. Like any, any system, um, you would be notified if anybody was to cut the power to the system. You would get notification that the system has gone offline the same way as you would with an alarm system. If anybody was to tamper with a landline, you have a cellular backup on your alarm system. With the camera system, you, if, if you had a rogue owner, um, like anything else, um, that person may have the ability to be able to, because they would have administrative privileges, they would be able to go on and disable it. But that's well. I, I mean, that would that would not for the, for the operator that would be suicide because you would have a window of where the state would be able to audit and find that you'd switched it off. It'd be like the lost minutes of audio tape from Nixon. Now, is uh, <laughs> when you say system, uh, are you talking about the system of all the cameras together, or is each each camera considered? Its own system. That is no, its no, own it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a it's a it's a total environment. So you have an NVR, which is it's uh, it's a, a large rack system. Right, but explain to what NVR means. Oh, a network video recorder. Sorry, sorry, a network video recorder. So it's in it's going to be in a server rack. Um, it's going to have forty terabytes of storage, which is more than adequate for the coverage. Um, they're all connected through IP addresses, so it's just on Ethernet system. Very probably very similar to the cameras that we have in here just now, running back into the system. So there's an incredible amount of redundancy, and also, uh, again, um, this would this is this has to be approved for the state as well. So the state has already got the requirements, and I reviewed the requirements by the state. And I believe that the system meets or exceeds all the requirements that the state has asked for. And they're pretty strict as well. One further question. Yes. Regarding motion sensors, is there any, are there any motion sensors on the roof since it's a flat roof system? I'm concerned about uh, roof penetration. Uh, the roof security, the, if there was going to be any access, perimeter access, I don't believe there is access into that space from the roof. What, so, about, what about some miscreant? Essentially, uh, cutting a hole through the roof. System. Then, then the internal alarm system would pick it up. So you've got you've got a security system. Yeah, I mean he's talking about. I, I understand he's talking about. He's talking about the the the, 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 the ninjas. So so uh, so. But to, to 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 your point, the only time that the product is 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 not in the vault, secured in the vault, is when the place is in in operation. So when the place is not in operation, all material has to be secured inside the vault, which is inside the building. So the vault has, yeah, yeah, the vault has an alarm system, the vault has the camera system, and the, the actual physical premises has motion plus glass breaks, a full security system over and above the cameras. The cameras are not the only, only uh, uh, security system. The cameras are only a set of eyes to be able to record all the activity that takes place inside the premises. Let me ask you something. Uh, I'm assuming that the state of Connecticut is set regular. I am not a security expert. Yes, yes. Okay. Well, well they have requirements. They have requirements. They have requirements. Yes. And you're indicating uh, on the record here that the security system meets the requirements or exceeds all requirements of the state of Connecticut. That is correct. Based by their guidelines. Thank That's you. correct. Is a security force hired to monitor the security system? 
Uh, the, the is the first line of defense the Webster police officer. No, no, no. That the, the system, the system is monitored twenty four seven by an alarm monitoring system. Okay, so if an alarm goes off, a security force goes and before the town of Westwood police. They would notify the police department. Okay. They notify the police department. They would dispatch. And then, any reason there isn't a redundancy to the UPS system? Um, the, I've the, seen, the, I've the, seen the UPS system due to age fail. Um, get old and. You're right, 100%. Um, the redundancy to that would be to install a uh, generator. But if there's no power to the premises, then you're not going to be open. And I'm not, I, I, I'm not sure what the longest time has been the duration for, for that section of Silestine to be out of power okay. for any more than 24 hours. But the state, the state, I understand your question, that the state doesn't specify in the regulations that um, you have to exceed 24 hours in time, but it's, it's definitely a valid well, point. If the batteries don't work, the alarm system will go off. I mean, that's, that's a given. The, the camera, if the cameras are interrupted, if any of the cameras go out or the NVR stops recording any of the hard drives, you get a text message as well as you get an email to notify you that there is a problem with the system. And that would be, there would be a, a chain, of, chain of response on that notification. If this person doesn't respond, then this, then this person, and then this person, and it works its way down, just like a regular telephone tree. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Right, thank you. I would like to discuss the 1,000 foot radius results because under state regulations as well as under your zoning regulations, there are certain things restricted within the 1,000 foot radius, specifically uses like a church. Now, as a uh, verification, We've identified a church at the intersection of Somerset Street and Silas Dean Highway at the northwest corner, a beautiful facility. Uh, as a land surveyor, we verified that there's over 1,050 feet between the closest point of the property of the church use and of the property of this application that exceeds the 1,000 feet. Now, there is a point that I'd I, I, I like to uh, mention, and that is there is a property at the southwest uh, corner of the Somerset Silestine Highway intersection, which is owned uh, by the church. However, The town uh, has determined that that is a vacant property. Uh, they have assessed it as commercial land use, and they've indicated it's commercial vacant. And the owner of the property, which happens to be a church, has to pay taxes based on its assessment. The point I would like to emphasize, it is the use of the property that determines the use of a church. In fact, my family owns a shopping center where one of the tenants is a church. So, you know, that use is a church even though it's a private ownership. And this is the flip. So, consequently, Um, this vacant land property would not be considered a church within the 1,000 foot radius. George? George, go ahead. I, I would like Peter to uh, define our regulation in that respect, please. George, just to answer your question, in your, in your um, packet, that you um, attached to the memo that I drafted, 
Uh, I did include a copy of the uh, regulation uh, in question in terms of the um, location uh, requirements. So section 5.11, subsection C, um, no medical marijuana dispensary facility shall be located within 1,000 feet of a church, comma, temple, or other place of worship or a public or private elementary or secondary school. So I would, um, I would concur with the um, testimony regarding um, and, and support the statement about it being a vacant piece of property. However, it's owned by the church, but it is not used for a church. So this regulation, as it applies, applies to the use of a property. And in this case, the use is, um, in essence, a, a vacant piece of property. And you have to decide it based upon its use right now and not what they might be wanting to do. Yes, you can't obviously predict the future and it's, uh, you know, as the regulations apply to it today. And yet they have owned it for many, many decades probably. And, uh, and it's owned, it's owned commercially. It. No, they have not. And in fact, didn't we once in a while the town property and that property we want to do something with them? We tried to package it for commercial development purposes. If you remember that the town went through the effort to uh, assemble um, town-owned property that was potentially developable further. This was one of them. Um, and it was uh, decided that they did not want to pursue that at the time. Who? The town. The town? Yes. Okay. Church. The church was approached. Really yeah, the church was approached, if I remember. Together. Right. But um, at the end of the day, it was the town's decision not to no. go forward with that. Thank you. Sure. Right. So uh, if, if that's the end of Jim's presentation, perhaps you could spend a few minutes and talk about the operations of the facility. We'd like, we'd like to also bring in a, 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 oh. our appraiser who did some analysis, market analysis in South Windsor. Good evening. Um, I'm Bob Mora and M-O-R-R-A. I'm a real, real estate appraiser. Uh, my office is in Vernon, Connecticut, 624 Talcottville Road in Vernon. I, just for your, give a little background, I've been appraising uh, both residential commercial properties for 38 years, including your, your lovely town. Um, and Mr. Mezzicato asked, said, to, asked me to look at uh, a dispensary as to what impact, if any, uh, the implement, implementing a uh, dispensary would have on residential property values. Not a simple project because there certainly aren't many dispensaries around. I chose South Windsor, I don't know if you're at all familiar with it, but South Windsor has a dispensary, it's on John Fitch Boulevard, which is Route 5, uh, in the southern part of the town, very near the town of uh, East Hartford, perhaps 500 yards from East Hartford. And that's been there for approximately two years. So to come up with at least an analysis that would, would show uh, some data that would that be useful, um, I don't believe in simply saying I think and I believe because nobody cares what I think and what I believe. Um, we always feel is look at the data and what the data tells you, that's where we are. So we, ex we took a, a radius from that point of two miles, uh, which extended both into South Windsor and into uh, East Hartford, and examined the sales of single family residential properties. We chose that because if you look at market conditions. If there's anything that, uh, I'd say a negative, it impacts single family homes more than any other type of property as opposed to like two family, three families, et cetera. So that's, that was our reasoning for that. So within this two mile radius, we went back two years prior to um, the approximate date that they opened, which was in, uh, 15, November of 15. 
to 285 sales. And that's a significant amount of single family sales. A large majority of them, most of them were in the town of East Hartford because it's obviously bigger. And we looked at, okay, what's the medium sales price? Which came out to be um, $150,000. That's median when you average in high, low, and whatever. We then, same area, took two years forward from that date. So we went to uh, from 15 to November of 17. And what, was, what, what, pardon me, what were the results? The results were there was actually an increase in value in the median, in, in the median uh, price. We also decided, to, let's see what, what the impact would be on sales, the number of sales. Because, you know, uh, one of the issues might be, well, nobody was selling or a lot of people weren't. But what we discovered actually was there, there was an increase in sales from the previous two, two years to the second two years in both towns, the town of East Hartford and the town of of uh, South Windsor. When you look at the data, it shows, as best that we can determine, that there's, there's virtually no impact to residential properties of having this dispensary within, within a reasonable distance of them. Um, I also took the initiative to speak with the town planner, and I invite uh, your planner to talk to the town planner of South Windsor as to their experience with them. Uh, we, I've done considerable amount of work for the town, and um, and obviously this is a verbal. I didn't include it in my report. That they they've had no issues with the uh, with that dispensary. So based on that based on that data, um, it, it's my opinion. The data shows me that uh, there is no there is no evidence that shows that. A dispensary, whether it's there or not, has an impact on a property, residential property value. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Yes, sir. I don't know. Maybe I'm overthinking it, but it seems like you've done half the equation. I mean, yep. you, you've showed what the, what the change was from 2015 to 2017 within two miles of the dispensary, and values went up by X, and the number of sales went up by Y, but that doesn't tell you anything as opposed to what the change in prices or change in volume of sales were in a control group seven miles away, you know, in a comparable area? What we looked at, thank you for mentioning that because I, I forgot to, do, to mention that. We did look at, looked at the, the, um, the model that we developed and then compared it town-wide because that would be the indicator as to what's happening. And, if, and I invite anyone to do that, and I, can, I don't have details for it tonight. We can email it to your, to your planner. But when, when we did that analysis, the trend of our uh, two-mile radius was consistent with the trend in the entire towns of both towns, both in, in median values and in uh, percentage of sales increase. So, okay. Well, that, that makes it useful. Okay. Uh, well, just to tag on to my fellow commissioner, uh, obviously you've done a, a macro analysis of this corridor, of this two-mile radius, a lot of factors. The economy has done well over two years. Right. What about a micro within, say, a 1,000 feet or, or less? We, I, uh, well, that's a good question. We, we, we started at, at a 1,000 feet, and then we went to a... a, a Half mile, mile, mile and a half. The problem with a short distance, there is just not enough sales data to, to, to come up with anything. It's simply you have one or two sales that, that show you there are no trends. You have to have a large enough, for, for any data to be of any value, you need a, a large enough circle. Is that because there are really no residences within a half a mile of the South Windsor? No, the, well, no, the, the, the residents... Pardon me? How many? How many within a half a mile? Well, give mile, pick, pick a distance. Oh, let's take, okay. Are you picking my brain? I'll have to go well, back. I mean, four <laughs> miles or eight miles into, you know, 
The number, well, the, the, no, in the, in the, all right, let's. Because I think the nearest, distant, nearest houses are across the four-lane ex roadway, uh, Route 5. They're on the other side. The Though they're in the rear and to the south yep. and also to the, to the east of, of the subject property. Go ahead. And, and if you look at the majority, the largest uh, population, single-family population base is actually on the East Hartford side, and approximately, I would say, 1,500 feet is where you have clusters of single-family homes. And as you go back, you might there's probably 20. There's, you can go. Like, wait a minute, I have a map. <laughs> I can look at it, but off the top of my head, I'm not going to. And since I'm old, I need my glasses. And I'd be happy to share, I have, I have copies for the board uh, that shows the map with the, the home clusters in and around it. But within, within a, a mile, let's say within a mile radius, um, you would have on both sides anywhere from 150 to 200. I can't count them out, homes. And, 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 it, and it's a heavy cluster that again moves out to the south, a smaller cluster to the west, and also um, a smaller cluster to the east. And I have copies of this for the board members if they'd like. I could give them to your clerk. If I could just ask you, how close to the South Windsor facility was the closest sale of all the sales that you looked at? I don't have that with me. I uh, honestly, can't. I, I would, I'd have to go back and look at it. We have multiple pages of data on that. I, 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 I don't recall right I mean, now. Do, do you know how close the closest house is, whether it sold or not? Is there somebody within 200 feet or 500 feet? Uh, or? The closest I would think was, is is nothing that close. It would probably would, probably would be 500 feet or or more. Does that answer your question? And it, well, I guess. Regardless of whether you remember but I do how know close the closest sales were, did you notice anything different in the closest sales than what you were noticing with the sales farther away or for the town at large? For the one or two sales that were closed, it, it, there, there was nothing that showed any, any difference. But you cannot, you, you simply cannot, and I cannot, use that as, as a model. It's, it's just two, two individual uh, type sales to, to do that. You, you would need at least a dozen or so sales very, very close to, to create that model. And that just didn't exist. You, uh, last question. Do you know, I forgot when you said in 2015 that other facility opened. Um, uh, November. November. Do you know how much prior to November 2015 it was publicly known that that facility was going to open? No, I don't know exactly. I would assume several months. Okay. That's why we went back two years. I think we're, we're trying to gather here is obviously we have homes behind here that right. are relatively 40 feet behind this facility. But is it your statement or your opinion that if you were to appraise those homes that there would be no decrease in value based on this facility being approved? Based on what I've come up here, that would be the initial analysis. Obviously, if you look at them, there might be other factors. But if you're saying if this is the only factor, correct. based on what I found out, I, it appears that no, there would, be, there would not be a, a, an impact. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Speak of the operation of the pharmacy, uh, called uh, Rakesh. My name is Rakesh Ezraki. As last time, we also discussed about the routine process of the pharmacy. The DEA is notified of the supplier from the manufacturer or the distributor who sent the medicine or the drug to us in a quantity wise. And we report every day to day prescriptions to the state. And at any point, the legal authority come to the pharmacy and ask the proof of the doctor's prescription, what is the diagnosis code, if there is a specific code, and signature, which document that it is the le legitimate prescription go out of the pharmacy. 
So, so honestly, because this is a separate application than the land so, use one, right? I guess I'd like to get on the record basically what I think uh, you, Ms. Mazzucato, can probably describe or yourself, either one, just how the day to day operations are and the hours of operation, et cetera, like we would any other land use request. The day to day operations are going to be open six days a week. School will be closed on Sunday. We'll be open 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. Where there's, a, just, um, the, the, there's actually a requirement where we need to be open minimum, minimum amount of hours by state regulations. But this, the town can mandate that we stay open earlier. I mean, that we open later or earlier or close earlier or stay later. But it'll be a six day a week operation. And access to the facility is controlled. In access to the facility is controlled. Uh, there's, there's a double checkpoint entry to be validated prior to entering the actual dispensary itself. So you, you'll be received at a, at a reception counter. You'll be validated. You'll be qualified as a patient or a patient caregiver at which point you'll be granted access into the pharmacy, the, the dispensary itself, where you would sit or meet with a pharmacist or pharmacy technician to either collect the prescription that you pre-ordered or create a prescription for yourself. You are allotted, a patient is allotted X amount of product a month and they come as often as, they're, as they could or as they're able to. And then if their prescription is expires, they have to wait for the following month. Uh, specifically uh, relating to the prescriptions, I'd like to call another speaker up. If Dr. Secor would come in, Dr. Secor will give a little more uh, explanation how patients are prescribed and how stringent the process is. Sure. For My pleasure. I'm Eric Secor. I'm um, one of the directors of integrated medicine at Hartford Healthcare. I work in the Cancer Institute. So by way of disclosure, uh, the Medical Marijuana Board has a number of physicians on it. So my direct boss, Dr. Andy Selmer, is on the board. Uh, my collaborator, which I run all of uh, pain management at Children's Hospital, Dr. William Zensky, is also on the board. And um, my collaborator, Dr. Jonathan Cost, who runs our pain management center, is also on the board. So my role is to help provide patients in the different subspecialties access to um, non-prescription, non-surgical pain management options. So I help to interact with patients, manage patients, and refer patients to the subspecialists who are required for um, enrollment for patients to be enrolled in the medical marijuana program. Um, are you all familiar with the conditions and the requirements now? Okay, so let me just read you the list real quick of, uh, of the conditions because they're growing. Absolutely. So what we are seeing is an increase in both the number of patients, um, the subspecialists who are enrolling, and the, and the proper management and use of medical marijuana. In our group, under oncology, we're seeing referrals for not only um, cancer pain management, cachexia, or the wasting of cancer, um, neuropathy pain. We're seeing increases for glaucoma, um, debilitating pain management post-surgery. Um, complex sympathetic dystrophy, um, epilepsy, Parkinson's. So my role is to support all those subspecialties. I support movement disorders for Parkinson's and epilepsy, the cancer programs for management and early diagnosis, post-surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation. Um, I support orthopedics in post-management, spine pain, and I support the pain management system. So um, that's exactly what we're seeing, that the number of subspecialties who are open to medical marijuana are increasing, um, the patients being prescribed medical marijuana are increasing, and importantly, the physicians, the patients have to be under the care of one of the subspecialist physicians. So I would say on average, not to violate HIPAA, um, we're seeing patients anywhere from mid-20s to 90s that are now openly using medical marijuana. So I have um, nurses, um, school teachers, uh, a wide variety of backgrounds of patients who are opting to try medical marijuana. I would say the number one reason, you all know, is because of opioid addiction, and we're not seeing the same side effect profile in the opioids that we're seeing in medical marijuana. And indeed, we're actually using medical marijuana in many cases to try to wean people off of their active opioids. Um, Brief questions. Because I know there's like there's some articles about the correlation between 
the use of medical marijuana versus opioids and that there's a correlation between those two? Is it a little early in so our state to tell that? Or? This is a completely emerging field, and we discussed this many times, that really the policy and the law is, is ahead of the science. And the most important thing for us is to actually work with pharmacists and work with reputable dispensaries because the way we practice in five years may be different than what we practice now because of emerging science. Um, most of the dispensaries are using a variety of different products. Uh, CBD, a cannabinoid oil, which is the non-THC version, um, is one of the newest emerging products. So what we're seeing probably in three to five years is that the science is changing, the addictive nature of the medical marijuana products is changing, and we all know that we're still in the infancy. So what are we, um, 2014, when did Colorado go? Um, it's only been a couple of years. So indeed, the science is still in its infancy, but clinically, we are definitely seeing um, improvements. We are seeing less side effect profile, um, and we are seeing benefits across numerous subspecialties of patients. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. One thing I've never understood about medical marijuana is why hasn't the medical field, research-wise, been able to take out of mar marijuana the needed benefits, medical benefits, and prescribe them through a regular pharmacy? I so, have never understood that. Nobody's, I never asked anybody. If, if I understand correctly, are you talking about removing the non-psychogenic properties, taking that out of the marijuana and prescribing that? Is that probably or the, the whatever they want from the medical from the medical marijuana, the mar marijuana? Yep. Uh, why can't that be taken from it and prescribed through a regular pharmacy? So that's exactly what's happening right now. So as the science drills down. And that's what you just. The CBD oil, exactly. So that's exactly what's happening, and that's why... Are they doing it? Are they They, they are success? actively actively doing it. <laughs> we actively have success. But remember, as physicians, you know, um, and as um, subspecialists, we rely on the pharmacy. We rely on the front-line uh, dispensaries to guide us. And so the dispensaries aren't on their own. The pharmacists aren't on their own. It has to be a, um, a community and a communicative process because as the science moves forward, they're gonna adjust and they have to be open to adjusting. The reason I'm here is because I know they're open to adjusting. No, They've been I, here, I hate, yeah. You've just said yeah, that before, yeah. right? Are you repeating yeah. it, so yeah. I, but I, I just wondered why they hadn't been They able are to doing do that. that, they are doing that. Sooner. Medical marijuana has a long history of use, as you can probably remember. It was prescribed in the 30s and 40s. Yeah, I think of it as maybe yeah. an excuse just to have marijuana dispensed in the community. Actually, Even with all the restrictions and, yeah. and the limited number of diseases that can be taken care of. The most exciting advances are in the non-habit forming, non-psychogenic properties, which is the CBD. So I think what you'll see evolve over the next few years is that that's exactly what will happen. So the, yep, the, edibles, the edibles, the products will evolve just cream. like, yep, emollients cream. So my patients are using the topicals, the creams, the emollients, the non-psychogenic products, and that's what we'll see evolve more. What do you see happening down the road if this happens with facilities such as we're looking at tonight? So I think they'll diversify, their products will diversify, and they'll become the experts in the field. That's what we're seeing across other states. And that's that specialty? Absolutely, right? absolutely. Whatever comes out of that. Yep. Somewhat of a home so in other words, yeah. you don't ever see it going to a regular pharmacy? Um, I think they might be some subspecialty. Remember, we have some federal rules, and then we have some state rules, and I'm not the, the rule guy, you know, so we have some, we don't have the same rule structure and law structure as we do with I other products. I thought you might not be too sure of where, you, where <laughs> things would be going. Because it's Don, a little so. bit of uh, background data along the same line. Uh, there, there's a, a dearth of, of research data and so forth relating to mar uh, marijuana usage for uh, therapeutic purposes, uh, you know, prior to, to uh, say 2010, mm -hmm. uh, and my understanding is that's the result of the impact of both federal and state uh, legal restrictions and criminalization of uh, of the marijuana field, which prevented researchers from actively engaging in active research, you know, over the past hundred years into this. This substance ever since it, it began to be you know, rather criminalized 
uh, at the beginning of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. You're correct. <laughs> in yeah. fact, if my memory in the 70s, it was lumped in with heroin. Yeah. So, yeah. If, if my memory was correct, is correct, back in 1969 or 1970, thereabouts, uh, President Nixon appointed a commission yeah. to study uh, marijuana. Their report uh, was essentially uh, outlining the potential benefits of it. Mm -hmm. They recommended much more research into it, mm -hmm. uh, the decriminalization of it, uh, and uh, that, that report essentially was rejected by mm -hmm. the Nixon administration, was not, you know, was not uh, published by the federal government, and uh, it was uh, led to even further restrictive criminal laws as a part of the uh, Nixonian Southern strategy at that time. Absolutely, but at the same time, you had the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, and Silent Spring, so there's a little bit going on. That was a little bit before my time. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you're absolutely right, and one more statement I'll make, um, which is a, a very important point. A lot of the research that was done previous to legalization um, was also suspect because of quality. So I, I wear a bunch of different hats. Um, I do grants for, um, I was at UConn for 10 years. Um, I work with Yale. I was employed by St. Francis, Haas for Special Care. So in my, in my grant research hat, um, my specialty is quality control of natural products. So an important point of having reputable people, reputable pharmacists, is that the quality control is one of the key things that we're looking towards now. And now, absolutely. And, and the research collaborations that are available, the product will come in-house, they'll be quality controlled, and some of us are already lining up to do um, reputable research on reputable products. So I think that's where the field will eventually evolve. When you know what the product is, you know what the quality control is, then you can take that product and put it into decent um, clinical trials. Thank you, Joe. So, let me ask Joe. you, from your experience, vast experience, have you found any difference in the operation of dispensaries um, and pharmacies as far as the community is concerned, or community acceptance, after um, they've been opened? No, based on my based on my patients who report to me who go to both CVS, Walgreens, and dispensaries, particularly the variety of patients that look similar to the people in this room, I think what you're seeing is the stigma is is decreasing. So I don't I don't see any. At first, it's a little bit suspect. I have patients who do not want to use it, um, but the physicians are like, okay, you've been on every single pain med that we could possibly do. You've been through five surgeries. So we're actually trying to support them in decreasing the stigma so they can try something that's legal and a good quality product. So we're pushing a little bit, they're pulling a little bit, but um, we don't see any difficulty there. Thank you. Yep. Joe, and, and then, uh, then I'd like, Joe has been waiting for a while. Um, and then I'd like to circle back eventually to the operations of this thing, you know, yeah. okay? Yeah. Which is primarily what we should be looking at. Great, thank you. Just Hi, a couple quick ones. Hi, sure. for, the, for the doctor and then the others are for the <laughs> applicant. But um, any idea approximately what the current count of eligible patients in the state is for this oh, I, type of product? You mean eligible as far as pain? As far as condition based, is that for what you're whatever, asking me? Right, to use it for whatever purpose, but a qualifying purpose per the state. So if we just say pain, what do we have? Three and a half million uh, particip um, citizens in Connecticut. So it's estimated that over 50% of people experience pain on a daily basis. So our, our challenge is what does that pain look like? Um, so pain in itself is not enough. You have to have pain associated with a secondary condition. Um, cancer, um, neurological condition, um, post-surgical issue, um, failed surgery, failed laminectomy. So I can tell you what we're seeing with the baby boomers age is those eligible to participate in trying medical marijuana are increasing rapidly. And um, just one other practical question, just yeah. curious. So for those people who really need it, are the insurance companies covering the cost of it? Um, I'm, not, I'm not on the billing side. Right. Um, I do know that I've heard people say that um, it's better than the illegal stuff I was getting. So, and it's better quality and the co-pays are less. So, I, I don't think that's a restriction. Okay. You know, um, I was reading an article that, that the FDA is putting sanctions to a certain version of marijuana. Has the FDA ever approved medical marijuana? Um, I'm not a history buff, but I, I know that it was legal. I know it was legal pre-prohibition. Um, it was prescribed regularly. 
Okay, I just wondered if yeah. the FDA approve, ever approved the product. Not until now, but now they're going to do it, yes. Okay. Thank you. They have approved it. Is that what you just said? Yeah. Not, not yet. They haven't yet. Yes. So the size of this facility, yes. how many, how many uh, employees, Thank you. What, what is the makeup of the employees, what is the traffic situation, how many, you know, People can you shuffle in and shuffle out in the course of an hour or two hours over the course of a day and, and when, so we can the, talk about our, traffic. When our business first opens, we'll have a full-time pharmacist on staff. Four? Full-time, a full-time pharmacist. A full-time. A full-time okay. pharmacist. As business will grow, we will have to employ additional pharmacists. We'll have pharmacy technicians, we'll have a receptionist, and we'll have a, a, a pharmacy manager as well. So how big could it get, assuming full occupancy? Full occupancy. We can, uh, um, two to three pharmacists and with technicians as well. We can have up to six office staffs, uh, staff members doing billing and uh, clerical work. We have ordering and receive receivables. Um, we'll have a receptionist at the front counter which will qualify patients to let them into the facility. Upon coming into the facility, they can meet with, speak to a pharmacist or go to a consultation cubicle and they can talk about different options that are out there and the benefits of different, different strains of product different types of products, if whether they would go with a topical ointment, an edible product. Um, uh, um, there's a tremendous, there's, there's uh, chocolates, there's uh, the, the product line in the business is growing extensively. As the doctor, as Dr. Secor said, um, as, as over, the, over the past three years, they've come out with a number of different products that were, that were not in existence years ago. So, so do I understand that you kind of said about 10? Is that about right? 10 employees, perhaps? Across between 8 10 employees, I would imagine, yes. Okay. And, up and upwards, of, up, upwards um, I was told, or sp speaking to a, f a fellow who owns an alternate pharmacy, a dispensary other, that they have eight pharmacists on staff covering so, different so hours. So that's where I was going to go next, right? So how many patients can you expect the consultation eight, eight to be the doing, patients. and is that normal? Is that big? It's, is that small? It started from the zero, so it goes gradually, simultaneously. You know routine, like you can handle eight per customer, like half an hour consultation, each customer as a new one. If it's a refill, there is no consultation, but it's a new one come in, you have to spend half an hour explaining advantage, disadvantage. And like, if I'm get backed up, I can have other two pipeline pharmacy. So it's gradually in and out. It's hard um, to say how many people you're going to have working when you first open. Exactly. So you're, day you're one, the of, right, but gradually business. you can go. Right. I'm, I'm actually thinking of the space. How many people, because when it comes to parking and demand and, and how, how many people are coming and going, it's, it's how much could you fit in that space? Uh, easily 15, 15 customer, no problem. With the parking, we have ample parking up front. And with the consultations, not all new customers come at the same time. There will be a refill. Mm -hmm. or somebody will be a repeat customer. So for them, it's in and out. They already order by phone that I'm coming on so-and-so date, and I have my, this product I'm looking for. So on that day, he just like five minutes in and out, gone. Only for the half an hour consultation for the brand new customer from the new prescription from a doctor, which I have to explain him half an hour consultation legally that documented what is the good and bad. That depend, it, hardly you get eight, 10, 15, and then gradually we can add, the, add extra pharmacies on the line. Mr. Chairman, I guess the question is, based on the square footage, what, you know, what is the maximum number of pharmacists we're voting on in this application or you're, you're, pro you're proposing to have in this application? Okay, right now I would say two pharmacists at the moment when you open, and gradually after like six, six months to one year, we can gradually add another four pharmacists like that. Because we have like four consultation room. So at any point, if you want to talk to the pharmacist, only pharmacists can talk to the customer. So we have that consultancy room where they can talk to the customer. So up to six pharmacists. And, and then support staff and whatever they, the <coughs> whatever they could handle in terms of patients. So I guess where I'm going is let's, let's turn around and address this like we would most other requests. And that is what's the traffic volume? What are the parking spaces? Mm -hmm. Is that adequate out front there given you know, the other uses? Do we know that? So uh, once again, referring to my May 9th uh, memorandum, um, the property did get a variance um, some years ago. I think that's um, listed back in 2003. Uh, variance uh, to have less than the required number of parking spaces uh, when the uh, building that exists now was constructed right now based on my uh, count and the as-built survey that we have, the site 
presently has 52 parking spaces. Uh, if you're familiar with the complex, um, Sherwin-Williams paint, um, which I would classify as a low intensity parking demand. They have contractors. Uh, I think the biggest activity there are associated with painting contractors coming in and picking up their supplies. Uh, you have this space, you have uh, the hangar uh, orthopedic uh, group, and then you have the bank. So I think the bank is probably you know, the most intense user of that, um, of that complex. Um, but there are 52 parking spaces uh, in the complex as it exists today. And as a square footage, is that a less than would be It's less, would be they, got, they got a variance, as I said, back in 2003. It's less than uh, was required. I don't, I don't think I made a note of what the um, total required parking would have been, but nevertheless, um, they did get a variance for that. How did you increase the parking two spaces? Jim. The space is smaller? No. I didn't, I didn't think so. <laughs> okay. Uh, for the record, Jim Sakonchik, the uh, site uh, designer. Right now, in front of the bank, you have a series of handicapped spaces all in one location, which is not logical. You want them more separated around the uh, facility. Uh, we have existing ramps uh, right here as well as over here. And we have the ability to modify this in order to uh, put the handicapped spaces here, which is centrally located, as well as over here, which is more centrally located and take advantage of some of this existing crosshatch to be the ramping area. As you might recall, a handicapped parking space has to be generally 16 feet wide, where eight feet is for the car and eight feet is for the uh, access. And they currently change the law so that access can be shared between two uh, spaces, which makes sense. You can't drive all the way through to the back through that space, No, can you? no, no, you cannot. Okay, there's curb and stuff. I oh, yes, know. yeah. So, by reconfiguration, uh, we're able to get additional uh, spaces. And let me just look it up so I can give you the correct number. I didn't know how because I saw both the plans looking about the same and I didn't know how you got two more spaces. I mean, the before and after that is what I was saying. Yeah, it's a. Uh, uh, 57 spaces, uh, were, as, as I designed it, with the required number of uh, uh, handicapped spaces, which would be uh, three. And it would also have an advantage for the bank, because right now any bank customer has to park over here, as you can see in the aerial, because all the handicapped spaces are poorly located. So just by this, this reconfiguration, we're able to more efficiently use the existing site. Right. Um, since I've never gone behind the facility, you described it as a wall and a fence on top of how, how high is the wall and does it go There's all the, the way through? It's about 10 feet tall go, and it's a, it, has a, it has a footing that goes subgrade four and a half feet. It's a 10 on foot, top of the, on top 10 of the, wall? Yes, on top of the 10 foot okay. wall. There's a six foot chain link fence that we erected okay. back in 2013. In addition to the chain link fence, there are abervites that are planted in row from both Wells Road to Bird which are actually mature now. Those, those shrubs must be some, I want to say 25 feet tall by now. Right. But there are a few on bird that we lose annually that we replace, and those are, they don't do well there for some reason. And, and the only thing that goes back there are your dumpsters and things of that Dumpster, nature? No, the dumpsters here. So, so what uses the back? Is it just fire? Axe? Fire, fire access. Okay. It's a sidewalk with uh, a rear a, entrance doors to the spaces. It's a four or five walk for uh, emergency exits for the most part. There's uh, really limited access to the rear of the building. You have to you have to pull into Wells Road, which is actually an exit. This is an exit. There's there's one per, one parking space here that the fellow from Hangar uses. Um, so there's no access here by vehicle. There's no access here by vehicle. There's actually uh, dumpsters in place here currently. Okay. There's two. The wall starts off. It's about 10 feet tall here, and it steps down to about four feet at the bottom at the lowest level in bird. 
Yeah. You can see the shrubs, they don't do too good down here, but they do, they do work very well back here. They, do, they go all the way down. Mm -hmm. You can see the, the, steel, the steel line, that's the, the top of the fence. Right. So, so um, the fence, the retain, the wall itself is almost to the top of the building, like two thirds of the way up, and then the chain link fence goes above our building line. Thank you. So I do want to get to the public, but uh, some last questions before we do that. Yeah, I guess, I guess I just wanted to get a better understanding on the parking, since I seem to have been obsessed about that two weeks ago. I might as well ask about it this time. Um, you know, there's a variance to provide less than the required number of spaces, and, and you know, I don't remember what the uses there were in 2003. I think they were probably all just basic retail stuff. You know, here we have it hangar a and cafe. It was actually a proposed coffee shop, which had um, a greater impact on parking. Uh, uh, retail with seating, coffee shop, restaurant, food users have a greater percentage of parking per square foot than does a pharmacy or a dispensary or with a bank or an office user like a hangar. Um, I don't have the exact regulation, but I want, I want to imagine it's um, four per thousand maybe. Am I right, Peter? Well, I mean, it, you know, you're the applicant. You tell us. I mean, um, We have a variance on the property. It's yeah, I mean, a ver parking. you have a variance, but I don't, I don't understand. The variance runs with the property, not with the applicant. Okay. And, and ask your question. No, I'm, I'm not, because I'm going to get interrupted, so I'm not going to bother. All right. Joe, did you have a question? Yeah, I was going to ask, what's the status of your licensing from the Department of Consumer Protection? Application was submitted uh, last month. Uh, we're going to update the application with an approval if granted. Applications are under review. The state does not have a, time, a specific timetable as to when they're going to respond to the applications. They're, they're, feel, they're feeling the, re, the applications and responding to them in a timely manner, I was told. And then my, my, uh, my other question has to do with the f front of the space that you're proposing to use. Correct. Are you proposing any changes to the, to the way it will look from the outside, either the door or if there's windows or, or anything else on that portion of the outside of the building? On the outside of the building, no. As you, um, as you can see from the interior layouts, we position the reception area and the, and the consultation cubicles at the windows in the front. The front door, um, the front door of the facility itself, and the side door is going to be, uh, it's going to be partitioned off from, from uh, site from the outside. So come into the, this is basically the reception area. This is an office, a receiving. Um, I'm sorry, this is a consultation area, and this is an office area. So the front half of the retail space will look like it would, it would be like an office area, doctor's office. And in terms of the outside walls of the building, though, you're not proposing no, any no changes change, from no the changes, way it no. looks today? Okay. Correct. All right. It'll, so it'll be exactly like it is now. Yolanda? Uh, uh, just a question. When you were talking about staffing, um, were you thinking at all about a security guard? Would, would there be a need for a security person? If needed, we will apply if one. Needed, okay. If needed, yes. But from what we've, the response we've heard from other municipalities and other police departments, there's no need, for, they, there's, there's no um, criminal activity to speak of in the facility other than uh, regular, well, not regular, but normal to other businesses in the area. Okay, because I do know that other dispensaries do have security staff, but... Um, I'm comfortable with your approach as needed. As needed, certainly. George? Yeah. Uh, I didn't smell it, but I don't smell quite as well as some people. And uh, it all smiles here. Uh, the, um, I've had somebody say to me that there is a fragrance coming from these dispensaries elsewhere. Um, is that an issue, especially in regard to the adjoining residences? Which I are don't see how there can right be. Above you. I don't see how there can be. A, a, there's there's no pr no consumption of product on on site. All product is sold and and, and dispensed in its original packaging, which is all sealed and airtight. Okay. Okay. And maybe Dr. Secor can. And I'm talking about either South Windsor or 
I could probably. But I, I didn't. But somebody said they did. All right. So, uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Finish your thought. Um, yeah, there was that. And uh, are you concerned really with the how close you are to the residents? You're not. As a, as a business, yeah. we, this is a tree, it's a retail business. I'm only and asking you because we don't seem to have a requirement like that. And like any other. I, I've heard and uh, that virtually many of the other um, town communities that have these have a distance to the nearest resident. And the ones that I know, which are really only two besides yours, uh, and maybe where Newington's is going to be uh, proposed. Uh, are the other two, the Hartford, South Windsor, are significant distances from residences. Hartford, it's so significant that I don't, I don't know where they are except over the Bow Spiral Bridge. Um, so that doesn't seem to bother you as a business person. You don't no, care. no, sir. Not, uh, we, we do business in many communities, and we, we're, we are, we're surrounded by residential in all the communities we do business. Okay. You go by the rules that we provide. Sure. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Yeah. All right. Um, let's, move, let's move on to the public comment. All righty. So if the applicant would uh, um, allow people to join us, you're right up front. Please, please come on up to the podium. Uh, start by introducing yourself and provide us an address, if you would, please. Hello, my name is Fran Nikitas. I live at 40 Bird Road in Wethersfield, Connecticut, and I am concerned for many of the issues that were spoken of here tonight. I have been up at the Weston Street Dispensary, and it does emit a very unpleasant odor. I happened to get lost up there and was trying to find a, a parking lot to turn around in and it smells. I am also concerned because I never received any notification of this meeting, the first meeting. Then when I got the notification for this meeting, it was gibberish. There was no date, there was no time, and I just, that concerns me, that if you're that careless to give me notice, how careless are you going to be when you are operating a, a, a medical marijuana facility? The other thing that concerns me, and I haven't checked recently, I'll be honest with you, but my understanding is that a medical marijuana dispensary, because of the federal uh, restrictions and the classification of it as a dangerous drug, has to operate on an all-cash business, including paying their employees in cash, and that if a buyer were to use a check or a credit card, it would trigger the federal law and subject you to arrest. I do know under the regulations that you cannot bring marijuana to any federal owned property. You can and probably will be arrested. So if you are a patient and you travel to um, an airport, you will be arrested if that dog sniffs you out. So uh, that's a concern, having large quantities of cash. As to the gentleman's assertion that this retaining wall is somehow going to isolate the residents, I myself have walked to Key Bank. I am not a ninja. I didn't have to scale the wall. I didn't have to scale the fence. I simply walked through the parking lot and around the sidewalk up Bird Road where our residences are. So this, this image of isolating this dispensary because there's a retaining wall is gibberish. Um, I don't understand why provisions were made for a buffer zone around schools and churches in, uh, and residences in other communities, but our residences were left out. Why isn't there a buffer zone for the residences on Bird Road? This route is traveled by school children, and it is just not appropriate to, to be placed where it is proposed. Um, I believe it belongs with other medical marijuana, with other medical buildings, or on the Berlin Turnpike, not abutting any residences. Um, the Hartford Dispensary borders no residences, and Newington has included the residence requirement in the 1,000-foot buffer zone. Please preserve our neighborhood and relocate the dispensary to a non-residential area. Um, 
Mike, I have a few concerns also. What happens, and it seems like we might go in that direction, if it's legalized? I don't know if any of you have ever been approached by an underage person outside of a package store pleading with you to buy them a six pack. Is that what's gonna happen here? Um, consider the impact on your neighbors by allowing this dispensary abutting our homes. It would dissuade me from buying a house if I was looking in this area. If I knew a medical marijuana dispensary was gonna be at the end of the block, it would, it would have a chilling effect on my desire to live so close to one. And I do worry about my property values. I've invested a lot of money in my house. I chose this community. I love this community. And to ruin it with this. Where so, do you live, ma'am? Bird Road. Oh, you're on Bird. I'm sorry. Yeah. Didn't catch it. Thank you. So please look to the future. Consider the future. Um, if this becomes legalized, I don't want this at the end of my block. And I don't want school children walking past it on a daily basis. Please. Thank you. Tom? Good evening, Tom Mazzarella, 600 Walcott Hill Road. I'm here tonight to voice my opposition to the special permit request before you. I have a number of items. I'll try to work through them quickly and not keep everybody here all night. Number one, the Weathersfield Land Use Handbook, Section 10, public notice requirement states that the applicant shall post a public hearing sign on the property and that the quote, the sign shall be posted in the front yard and not more than five feet from any street line and shall be clearly visible to the general public. I'm passing around a picture that I took yesterday morning of the sign. The distance to Bird Road was measured at 19 feet to, to the curb. The distance to the Silas Teen Highway was over 20 feet. The placement of the sign is so obscured from view that it could only be less visible if the applicant placed a trash bag over it. You might feel that I'm being petty, but the fact of the matter is there's significant confusion in town about this application. Many people that I spoke to about tonight's meeting thought that the zoning regulation change approval on March 23rd was in fact an approval for the dispensary and they didn't feel there was a need to come out here to uh, further voice their opinion. In my opinion, the applicant clearly wanted to avoid attention by placing the sign out of the public view. Second item, the, applicant, the application presented does not meet the section 511C1 as the applicant's parcel measures approximately 851 feet to the boundary of Corpus Christi Church parcel 205013 as shown on my drawing that I submitted yesterday. This parcel was deeded to the church in 1946 and has enjoyed a tax exempt status for 70 years as part of a church property. The newly adopted zoning regulation calls out for a 1,000 foot minimum and this application clearly falls short of that minimum. You have all received my letter on that, I hope. I don't believe this commission can legally grant a waiver for this requirement. As to the applicant's comments earlier regarding that parcel, I spoke, I first checked the land records and found out that it was deeded to the church in 1946. I then talked to the town tax assessor and when I inquired about the tax exempt status of that property, I was told, quote, that will be on the tax rolls this year. So I asked her, are you saying that it's changed? Yes, it was changed due to a change in the law that allows un, let me get it right, unimproved parcels can no longer be exempt. I asked when the change occurred. 
The law changed this year. I asked when the tax exempt status changed. I was not given an answer. I asked three times. There's something going on here. I believe that, that the tax exempt status was changed, probably for this applicant. And I would like to further investigate that. How can the town accept that property as being tax exempt for 70 years as a church par parcel, and now all of a sudden it's not a church parcel? I don't agree with it. Three, the special permit approval process outlined in the Weathersfield Land Use Handbook lists several factors that should be considered by the commission when granting approval. This application falls short on several of these. One, ensuring that the proposed use will be in harmony with the neighborhood. And two, that the compatibility with the neighborhood and has adequate parking. Section eight of the regulations 8.2 states that the proposed use or activity will, will not alter the essential characteristics of the area or adversely affect the property values in the neighborhood. I don't agree with the applicant's uh, appraisal comments about the property valuation. The, the parcel in uh, South Windsor is not the same type of parcel as what we have on the Silestine Highway in the quote town center. It's in a strip mall. It's not in a very desirable area. There's a tattoo shop next to the dispensary. It's not like adding a dispensary next to this strip mall is gonna, gonna affect the property values over there. The property values over there reflect uh, the quality of the businesses that are in place there. Now you're gonna take our town center and put a dispensary in there, and I think it's gonna affect the the values. There's also not enough history for them to, to legitimately justify the claim that it's not going to affect property values. What if it's granted and then the property values do change? Who's going to help us then? Article, uh, Section 8, Article 8, 8, 4 states that the entrance and exit driveways or light or should be laid out to achieve maximum safety in regard to access onto roads and streets and that the parking should be adequate. At a previous meeting uh, for the zoning wording change, I provided you with my amateur version of a traffic study where I concluded that the similar dispensaries generate 102 vehicles into the property per hour of the hours that I sampled. Well, wait a minute, stop, Tom. You said that's the South Windsor one you just said now? Yes. You said that the last time when you testified on the zone change. Yes, 102 cars Repeat per hour. Repeat again, please. Pardon me? Repeat that again, 102. It was 102 vehicles either entering or leaving the property in one hour period. I recorded them. Right. I gave how, you a copy long, of that. Did, yeah, you don't probably know the answer to this, but uh, how long did they tend to stay there? It varied just as the applicant suggested. There were some people that, and it was very hard to track who went in and who came out. You know, you had to pick the guy with white hair and so forth. Easy. That's right? why I didn't think you could do it. Yeah. I wasn't sure. There was a few cases where I was able to, to recognize someone going in, staying for five or ten minutes and coming right back out, where other people stayed there for a long period of time. Either they were shopping longer and couldn't decide what they wanted, or they were going through this interview process that was discussed. I don't know. <clears throat> I question whether, <clears throat> whether a traffic study and a parking study is required for this. And if, if so, are there any criteria for, for a dispensary other than the you know, four parking spaces per thousand square feet of, uh, of shop space? I don't, I don't think that there will be uh, you know, some standard of how many parking spaces you need for a for a facility like this. I know I have gone by the by that strip mall during the daytime. Uh, it appears that the bank occupies most of the parking spaces. The parking spaces that are typically empty are the ones to the south on the Bird Road up against this uh, retaining wall. Not a lot of extra spaces. And you're talking about eight to 10 employees 
and maybe 15 people in there, you're talking about 23 spaces. That's half of the spaces. I don't see it. How about the traffic entering and exiting at the South Dean Highway, so close to the Wells Road intersection? Is that an issue? I don't know. I'm, I know there's traffic engineers up here. Maybe they can comment. 8.8C, the proposed use or activity will further the goals, objectives, and policies and will be consistent with the recommendations of the plan and conservation development report prepared by the town. <clears throat> Although this commission revised the zoning regulations, the plan of conservation and development stands as presented. And this use clearly falls outside the recommendations in that report. I'll spare you all the text about what, what the plan envisioned for the area I, I went through it last time. But this application does not Excuse meet me, that John, intent. Can you highlight it? Pardon me? Can you highlight the points? Uh, it, it was striving for a, a more walkable area, um, pedestrian friendly, and a blue back square type environment. And it doesn't talk about medical marijuana dispensaries. It doesn't talk about pharmacies. Uh, they, I think they envisioned maybe a coffee shop, maybe a bakery. Uh, something that people would stroll down the street, grab an ice cream or something like that. Not zip in from another town, stay five minutes, buy their prescription and leave. And 8.9, that the use will enhance community development. What can this use possibly do to enhance the community development? I would like someone on the commission to explain to me how this can be justified as enhancing the community. Uh, in my opinion, it brings zero to the town. At the previous meeting, we heard some rough numbers of possibly 75 town residents that uh, could benefit by this facility. And we also know that within five miles, uh, a five or 10 minute ride, uh, you can get your prescription filled either in uh, Weston Street or on Route 5. So I don't believe it's a severe inconvenience for 75 of our residents to travel that distance. We were also told that a caregiver can very easily obtain a license or a prescription so that the person that's in need of the medication can have a, a care worker travel to the facility for them and get the prescription, just like they could go to CVS and, and pick up someone else's uh, heart medicine or whatever. So I really don't see the benefit to the town. And lastly, I want to remind the commission that the sale of med marijuana, medical or otherwise, is a federal offense. And the town shouldn't be supportive of a, of a business that violates the current federal law. In summary, I believe that the revised zoning regulations are flawed and should never have been approved. The Weathersfield plan of conservation and development was clear in what the goals were for the development of this town center. If the dispensary is so innocuous as presented by the applicant, often being compared to a doctor's office or pharmacy, then I wish someone would explain to me why there's a thousand foot separation requirement to a church or a school, and also why that criteria has not included a distance requirement to a residential property. You've heard tonight from people on Bird Road, uh, they're within eyeshot of, of the facility, and I don't think they need to be uh, having that kind of a facility there. And we saw it in uh, Newington. Newington's proposing it, it to be in, an, in the back of an industrial area so that it's, it's indiscreet. People want to come there, get their marijuana and so forth, that's fine. And I also just want to make one more comment. I know I've talked too long already. But the, uh, the comment about the smelling of the product, okay? We all know that it's illegal to open a liquor bottle on the premises of a liquor store. Yet we've all been in parking lots and seen somebody buy a nip and sit in their car and drink it or they have a beer in a paper bag and they drink it. And who's to say that someone's not going to buy some medical marijuana and they're not supposed to use it on the premises 
but they get in that car and they light it up and the windows are down and the odor affects the neighbors. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions? I'd be glad to answer. Because every time I step away, George asks me a question. <laughs> I, I know why you were asking. I know why you were asking. I was going to ask you several, but I won't now. <laughs> I'm John Mahitas, also at Ferdy Road Road in Wethersfield. Uh, you may have guessed that by now, but uh, <sighs> I, Mr. Matsukato has a, seems to have a lot of things wrong with his presentation. Um, he brings someone in from South Windsor who has no bearing, it's useless information, it's a waste of time. All he's doing is telling you about a, a place that has no bearing, no look like our facility, our town, and our street, and our neighborhood. Uh, so it makes no sense. So he's bringing that in to give you smoke and mirrors to make it sound like he's a really Really, he's trying to be helpful to the town, telling you good things for the town. But he's not. I wish I had put a bakery in. We would have liked that. But anyways, this house right over here, you're seeing on here, they have young children playing in the backyard. It's right on the bunning of this thing. I mean, people aren't reading to that, reasoning to that. I don't understand why. They're right here. It's not, it's not 100 feet. It's 40 feet away. They have a nice backyard. They just moved in. And now they're going to have to have, what, the children can't play in the yard? Possibly. I don't know. Now, again, Newington has 1,000 feet. I don't know why we didn't do it, but we didn't do 1,000 feet. Does it make any sense to say you can't have it at a church, within a church distance or that, but people who go to the church can go past here. People who go to the school can go past here and have it. So they're on the way. The church, school is there. Kids can go this way. There's plenty of children right on this street, right near the end of it, who ride their bicycles up and down. How is that appropriate to have a mer medical marijuana in the same place they are in? So that's another thing. Another one's he's talking about a pharmacy being there. A pharmacy was on the other side of the Wells Road. It was Silestine Pharmacy, I believe it was called then. So it wasn't a pharmacy in the same property. It was on the other side. So he's trying to tell you, oh, there was already a pharmacy there. No, there was not a pharmacy over there. So these are things that are, he's trying to tell you, but you really have to read between the lines and see what he's saying. It doesn't make sense, a lot of the things he's talking about. This is not what should be in our neighborhood. It's not should be around here. Our houses are over here, and our values will change on the property values. Now, I'm 61 years old. I don't know if someday I may decide to retire, and we may have to decide to move and downsize a little bit. What's going to happen to my property value? I, depending on that house having a decent value. So that's another thing going on. As well as, I'm also a caregiver, by the way, for medical marijuana, so I believe in it fully. I do go occasionally to the Hartford location every four to six weeks to pick it up. There's not a line, not a crowd. It's not a big demand, and it smells. You can't miss the smell as soon as you get out. It's not smelling like somebody smoking marijuana. It just has an odor. It has an odor everywhere through the building, everywhere around it. So when the fellow over there is saying he doesn't have an odor, I don't know what they're doing in their facility, but the Hartford one has an odor you cannot miss. So does that going to happen to everybody else? So I don't know why. He brings a person in who says he runs a facility, has no odor. I don't get it. What is Hartford doing that's so wrong then? if they have such an odor. So I think there's a lot of smoke and mirrors being given to you guys to say how great this is and how, you know, a good thing it is for the town. But it's good for Mr. Mozzicato because he needs to rent the facility that he owns and it's not being rented right now. And I appreciate that as a businessman. I appreciate you wanting to get your income. I understand that. But this is not for the benefit of the town at all. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else from the public? I would like to speak. All right. Oh, where are they? We received these tonight. Mm -hmm. All right. So, uh, for the record, there are there is an email. Any other questions, Mr. Chairman? I'm sorry. Can we ask any other questions, or is the effort coming back? So, let me go through a uh, comment that we received tonight. Um, this is from Paul Zeno. Uh, apparently, Battison Cleaners. I'm writing as a proud longtime resident. I'm in favor of a medical marijuana dispensary in Wethersfield, knowing firsthand the benefits of the treatment. My neighbor is a patient um, and uh, is in support of the situation. Is there another one here, Peter? Okay. And the other one is from Tom, who just spoke, and I presume. You covered all the topics. I don't have to go through the letter. All right, very good. So thank you. Um, yes, perhaps the applicant would come back and join us. 
And George? Yeah. Um, your relationship to the Franklin Wellness Center, would you describe it or explain it a little bit? My relationship is going to be principal, one of the principal owners of the facility. Your, prin your principal? With Correct. Franklin Wellness Center. Correct. Oh, okay. uh, a couple of questions. Um, are the hours of operation uh, set by the state of Connecticut? Minimum numbers of hours of operation set by the state. Maximum can be determined by the commission. Uh, are you willing to, if this commission would approve this application, be subject to hours of operation? Absolutely. What, what, what are you looking for for hours of operation? We like to do 9 o'clock to 8 p.m. And Saturday it will be at 9 o'clock in the morning to 4 p.m. Say that again, 9? Nine. 9 to 8 during the week, 9 to 4 on Saturday. We're, sub we, we're receptive to work. Closed on Sunday. Closed on Sunday. We're receptive to uh, reg uh, restrictive hours. If, if you need, that's also a condition that Peter put in the, in the notes. You submitted a specimen sign um, on your, in the application that, you, that was submitted. And you've indicated the sign would say Franklin Wellness Center. Uh, if approved, would you agree that the word marijuana dispensary would not appear on the sign? If that's stipulated in our regulation, we would, yes, in our approval process. So um, this, I assume you're going through Peter's thing, and there are, there are several things that we can control as part of this right. uh, uh, process, right? And the hours of operation, the signage. We, is, we, we, we're receptive to the hours of operation as long as we didn't conflict with the state law, the enough. minimum hours of Fair operation. Enough. The, the sign that was conceptualized, um, what's the maximum square footage that they can have? Do you, do you know offhand? It's one uh, linear foot for every, uh, one, one square foot of signage for every linear foot of frontage. Uh, actually, I take that back because they do have a freestanding sign, so it gets cut in half. Okay, so they so they get to have something up on the face of the building, wall they get sign, right. something yes. on the freestanding sign out, of, right. out by the street, right? Um, what's nothing else in the windows? Cause you're not changing the windows, so it's glass, et cetera. We wouldn't because that's not allowed, anyways, right? So nothing goes in the window. Uh, up to 25 percent of a window could be occupied by signage, so um, you probably would want to stipulate that if that's your concern. Thank you. Um, Service and products offered. I, I don't know what we would do to con to discuss that, but if somebody on the commission has some thoughts, throw them out there. And product visibility. Um, I, I guess you know once you're inside the building, um, I don't know how you visualize a product, right? So I'm, I guess it comes back to the signage, right? We would I wouldn't want personally. I wouldn't want to see signs that had the product in it, but. All things for discussion. Right. I think the state regulations have limits on the sizes of the signs as well as the content and graphics. Okay. It might be more restrictive than our zoning regulations. Can you speak to that? I don't have the exact requirements, but I know they're, they're, most of the rules are more restrictive at the state level than the, than the municipal level. Okay. Other questions for the applicant? I guess this is a question either for the applicant's engineer or for Peter. Um, the parking, you know, what what is the parking demand for the current uses and how many spaces are provided? And I guess part of it is, you know, the, the way this has been described, it doesn't sound like it falls neatly into the category of regular retail. I mean, it, it sounds more like a hybrid of a medical office, you know, given that people aren't just running up to the counter getting their stuff and leaving, that there may be, you know, prolonged conversations with pharmacists, um, you know, that affect the traffic. And also that all of the uses in this plaza are, you know, service businesses operating during roughly you know, the same general hours. We don't have, you know, the the issue of, you know, shared parking and, you know, compatible non-contiguous uses and so forth. So, um, you know, I, I know Peter's memo said there was a variance, but I don't know, you know, how much of a variance and whether that variance was t 
tied to a particular proposed use that required the variance or, or what. So um, I just kind of wanted to get a sense of what the, you know, according to the regulations, what would be the required number of parking spaces for each of the individual uses, you know, particularly given that he's talking about, you know, six, eight, ten employees plus however many you know, patients are coming in plus, you know, the bank plus hangar plus the, you know, the Sherwin Williams, um, you know, just kind of how that all works. Sure. So your regulations, <clears throat> this entire building and, and maybe Reno can confirm this, it, uh, the addition, uh, which is where this use would be and where Sherwin Williams was, was the, was the portion of the building added in 2003. That's a little less than 7,000 square feet. Um, so I think the entire complex, by looking at the 7,000 versus what's existing, is probably 13 and a half, 14,000? Uh, closer to 13. So, so the parking, present parking requirements, uh, it's five per thousand. So that's 70 spaces roughly required. Um, they're proposing 57. I do support the idea of switching around if you look at the actually probably in your packet if you look at the aerial photograph of the complex while we're talking about this you can you can see what we're talking about um, <clears throat> by getting moving the handicap parking around it opens up some additional spaces none of those spaces if you look at the aerial photograph are being used at the time this shot was taken um, less than half of the parking uh, is being occupied and you can see uh, this confirms what I stated, which is, you know, primarily the tenancy is uh, the high demand is the bank. So you can see all of those spaces clustered near the bank. They would be closer if they could park in the handicapped spots. And then there were a few spaces for Sherwin Williams. And then there were a few spaces right next to where the window um, business was. Um, but you can see by this ph photograph, there are probably less than half of the spaces. I think there's 31 by my, out of the 52 that are available for use. I can't say, you know, what time of day this was, which would, would have been helpful, but I, I think you can see from that exhibit there's, there's plenty of parking based on the activity that was going on at the time um, this photograph uh, was taken. And I did it think- It looks like midday, because there are no shadows. Yeah, that's, so that's probably right. Um, so that gives you a flavor for how much uh, parking is available, plus they're going to be adding another five spaces by reconfiguring some of the striped areas and such. Uh, I, as I said, the paint business does not get a lot of traffic. You can see a couple of trucks right up next to the building, which is once again what I said. You get contractors who come in there, they load up, and then they, and then they take off. So that's not a, a high demand. And I think you heard some testimony from some of the uh, public that their observations or if they've been to the Hartford dispensary, there's no more than a couple of people in there at any particular time. Um, so I, I'm not real concerned about the parking. Uh, it is uh, less than your regulations would normally require, but um, you know, I think that's a good, good summary of what you might anticipate. It's hard to predict what this business is gonna do, but you know, my experience going to a pharmacy is you know, there's three or four people in line at one time. So. Um, you know, the bigger, the bigger challenge may be, you know, where the uh, employees uh, are going to park. Um, you know, if there's 10 or more, you know, that's going to eat up a sizable uh, number uh, in the parking lot. Um, yeah. So I think it's more the employees than the, than the customers. Yeah, I don't think the concern is right. nearly as much for the customers, patients, as so much as the most optimistic view of this business as a 10 employee business that's right. the that's the thing but the 10 um, employees will be on rotation of the, around, around the schedule not everybody works at the same time throughout the day well that's good to know but you know you go to south windsor and i was there in the morning uh, some time ago um at and one of the people in the audience mentioned it also that it, it's congested in, in that location. And uh, the thing about Hartford, you have to keep driving around, around, around there to find adequate parking. Some people even said they had to go to McDonald's next door or something. 
um, I'm concerned with the parking issues here. You can control it to some degree, but not really. Uh, the turnover is a factor, and you can adjust the appointments probably. But um, my question to you is, what happens when you don't have adequate parking? What are you going to do as an owner? And uh, this is your place. For, how, how are you going to provide? For well, it? as an owner, you would you would have to employ more staff behind the counter to turn people to the doors quicker. So bringing having it, you when initially we'd employ one to two pharmacists to start the operation working one per shift to manage the hours of operation. If you have, if you see that you have too much traffic as in the customers, as customers, you put more people behind the counter to turn, to turn the customer base over quicker. So you would see less custom, customers coming and going quicker, not being, not being so in the So you're going to adjust your schedules to accommodate? Schedules as well as staff. You, if, if staff? Sure. And if you have, if you have two pharmacists and, and technicians, you would be able to turn more people to the doors. You'll be able to service more patients. Well, the quicker. staff are, is part of it, but that's a given. Pretty much, you can control. But I mean, you also control the patients to some degree. But I think overall, there's a heck of a lot of people coming and going. It's a, it's a big demand, and I don't know of any adjoining areas where you can go park. For the you? new for the newcomers, we cannot control. But for the refill customers, we can control. Like say, ten people came in today. We can tell them, okay, today we are all booked. We have to schedule for tomorrow. That's fine because they do have two, three days advance supply before they come to pick up or before they call for the refill. So it's not like they are all out at the same day, same time. They always call three days ahead. So for the newcomers, yes, it's challenging. But for the mm -hmm. refills, we can schedule day accordingly what we can accommodate for them. They'll park behind Max Pivos. I'll tell you that right now. I'm, sorry, bro. I'm not sure I agree with all that, but. I don't want to suggest a parking study, but I drive by your site every morning at 7.45, and there are approximately 16 to 20 cars parked there. I assume it's employees. And I can basically tell you, several of these cars in this aerial photo are there every morning at quarter of 8, 7.30 in the morning. So I'm just trying to figure out, you know, when you pop, as he was saying, 100 and something people over an hour, which I can't imagine that, whether it's... I'm just saying this aerial photo here is, a, is approximately what's there at 745 in the morning, every morning. I mean, it's the, the paint truck, and then all, the one, all those cars parked in the front parking place, it must be employees, because I see them every morning. I'm just pointing that out. Peter? Why, when we set up these regulations, didn't we require a distance to the nearest residence? Mm -hmm. uh, I understand, I have reason to believe that many of the regulations of many, a non large number of towns, there is a distance requirement for residences. And as you know, Newington, for example, where they're proposing this, excellent location. A brand new building, so forth, and it's down back where you can't, you know, and it's uh, it's obvious. And I know we have a problem in this town with distance as far as the ability to accommodate medical marijuana in a more commercial area. But uh, Hartford and South Windsor are their commercial areas, and even South Windsor is significantly some distance from the adjoining residences there has already testified here tonight. George, with all due respect, you're asking me this now after you guys approved I'm the sorry. regulation. I, I, that's all I can say to you is you approved the regulation without a, without a separating distance of residences. I can't really respond to, to that after the fact. Some towns, I can respond to the, to the fact some towns do have them. Not all of them have uh, separating distances to residents. So it's, it's all over the place. Uh, as I mentioned before, some towns treat these like any retail use. Some treat them like pharmacies. Uh, they don't have special regulations, so I, there is no standard regulation. That uh, I think it was testified that almost all towns or most towns have a separating distance of residence. I, I would not. Uh, I would not agree with that. So um, some do and some don't. And, and it, George, it's my recollection that we had this discussion during the zone change, and uh separation distance to residences would have effectively any separation distance would have effectively removed any parcels from applicability 
We wouldn't be able to have them in time. Anyway, there, was only, there was only seven or so properties to begin with, and putting uh, you know a separation distance of residences. That's now true in part right. of my right. comments. Right. So would have managed to zone out. Right. So this commission approved this particular zone for this particular um, use, and uh, or this this use for this zone. Put it the other way around. Um, and the residential setback is not there. Yeah. What else? Is there anybody else in the public that, uh, so I see a couple of faces in the back and just want to make sure everybody gets heard. Um, is everybody comfortable that they've heard everything they, they think they need to on this? Are we ready to uh, take a motion on the hearing? Or do they have more questions? Uh, Mr. Chairman, can we address the public notice, whether that was proper? Thank you, yes, yes. So there was testimony that um, there was uh, some uh, errors in the notice. This uh, hearing was actually uh, scheduled for an earlier meeting date uh, because the notice, we found out after the fact the notice was defective. Um, we received a call from uh, some neighbors saying that they had received a notice and there was some confusion. So um, we did uh, direct the applicant to re-notice uh, for this night meeting. We do have a copy of the revised notice in the file and a copy of the uh, certificates of mailing that were mailed to the neighbors. So uh, at a point in time, there was an error in the notice, but that error was corrected so that the purpose of the notice submitted for tonight's meeting was correct. So everybody in this circle got something in the, in the They got it twice. No, oh. excuse me. I never got the first notice. I never got the first notice for the first meeting. Well, the first one wasn't for this. The first one was for a I, I can't say that they got it, but it was mailed. I, the way your regulations are set up, you require what they call a, a certificate of mailing, which is different than a certified mail. The certificate of mail is evidence that it was put in the Postal Service and mail to that address. Whether they received it, we don't require that they sign the card as certified mail would be. So I can't speak to an individual as to whether they did in fact get it, but it was mailed to them. We do have evidence in the file that it was mailed. We got it, however, the second notice was received. And this is what we're here this evening for. On, we're not here on the first notice, we're here on the second notice, which was properly sent and received. And what's our requirement on the sign? I don't remember. Uh, it was quoted uh, in the regulations. Um, as you, if you have been by the site, the, I, I would have to argue that the location and you know what was blocking it um, in this particular case, it, it was less than maybe as obvious as it could have been um, in terms of where it was located. It was located at the corner of Bird and the Silas Dean Highway in a landscaped island. It's, it was visible. I mean, you could see it, but it could have been more optimally located but it was placed in time and it was up uh, on the day it was required thank you other thoughts just, just a question i have i just occurred to me because i was just looking at the hours the proposed hours so um what was my question if you if you're going to one medicine medicinal dispensary is it possible to go to a different one if you need for example if i go to a pharmacy and it's closed on you know it uh, it closes early can i go to a different mm -hmm. dispensary yes, it, yes, it has no. to be certified to be at one dispensary only only doctor and you have to yes you can change your right you can you know, apply for the change you have to be consistent you have to consistently go to that that only if dispensary. you want any circumstances you didn't like it there's an application form to change it, and then you can go for that. So if it's only once, you can only do it once a year as a patient. Okay. Well, that's where the regulations at the, federal, at the state level are. Because my thought when I was looking at the hours, which is a little confusing, because I think um, in your application you say open 9 to 7, you mentioned 9 to 8. I'm, I'm, I made a mistake. 9 to nine 7. To Those seven. Are, are okay, yeah. so it's only an hour. No yeah. 9 to 7, then say 9 to 4 on Saturday, closed on Sundays. But my thought is that the dispensary would then be open at nighttime in the winter, was my thought. And would that be, would that be a concern? You know, sometimes it, how is your lighting actually on the? Very good actually. We're well, the, the shopping center is well illuminated at night. Yeah, 
this. So my concern was that, you know, my concern is about loitering, and my, and my concern is not so much about, it sounds like you've really done your homework this evening, and it sounds like I, I, I trust that you would do a nice job managing the whole facility. I'm much more comfortable than I was last time you came. Thank you. Okay. But it's not just the management of the facility, it's about the, the people that are coming in. And, and that, that badge that lets you get into the facility doesn't happen at the parking lot. It happens to get into the building. And I don't know what kind of different kinds of people come into the dispensaries. I think for the most part, they're, they're, they need they need these items, and uh, so anyway, I'm, my concern is loitering. I don't why, and that's my concern. So generally, our cancer patients, our orthopedic spine patients, our hip replacement patients, our knee replacement patients, um, that's who you're considering worried about loitering. So our patients are, are um, they're not highly, uh, the high loitering demographic, if you will. Yeah. So, yeah. so there I, is, I, that's true, that, that's, there's that side We're not of seeing it. a 16-year-old to 18-year-old male demographic who's loitering. That's not who we certify and prescribe medical marijuana okay. for. There have been loitering in other dispensaries, though, that I've heard. Uh, that's why I'm saying it's a good, you know, it happens, right? It happens at different locations. I think your site is very visible. Yeah, that's true. Well, that's true. So that was my question. So I just want to ask some, some, you know, the commission in general, you know, as we sit here and think about, are we ready to close a hearing? Are there things in particular that, um, you know, you don't have enough information on? Is parking, are you park, are you struggling with parking, you know, if you're thinking about approving this, that kind of stuff, right? Good. Well, I had a completely different question. I was, I was going to ask whether the pharmacist who had been testifying is part of the entity that is part of, you know, that is the applicant. Mm -hmm. Yes. 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 Okay. Thank you. R R Rakesh is going to be the, the managing partner, pharmacist on staff, on duty. Okay. Which overseeing day to day operations. The operations will be run by the, by the licensed uh, pharmacist. And what's your background? Uh, as a, I'm an independent pharmacy owner since this is my fourth year in Rocky Hill. Before that, I used to work for Walgreens for 15 years. Thank you. George? Yeah, um, Peter, do you have any issues outstanding on the site, such as lighting, uh, pavement, or uh, other issues like that? In my memo, there were just a few minor things. There's some curbing that has deteriorated on the bank drive through side. There's a catch basin that has settled, which is apparently scheduled for, for work. And then, obviously, when the handicap spaces are moved around, we will have to ensure that it's properly marked and uh, identified with so signage. Those should be conditions. Definitely. And, uh, yep. okay. You noted two, Peter, you noted two site conditions that needed rec repair. Yes, the curbing and the catch basin. Is there a site plan review process that you're going to be picking that up, or is it just a, a building permit? They submitted um, as <coughs> one of their. Um, items in the application, uh, a revised uh, layout for the parking. We'll, we'll just have to confirm proper dimensions and you know all of that before we allow occupancy. And, and corrective measures to the parking lot if that's uh, right. I think that those should be uh, those conditions. Are actually, those yeah. are actually slated to Peter, regardless. are you concerned about the parking issues that have been discussed? And, uh, they might could be inadequate maybe or not? As I say, the, the wild card, uh, I. I'm concerned about is the number uh, of employees. As I was listening and doing the math, if this is successful and they have multiple pharmacists, multiple pharmacy techs, uh, six uh, office support staff, receptionist, um, you're talking 12, you're getting closer to 15 than you are to 10. Um, so, you know, that's, and, and as you do the math with the, you know, you're, you're getting, you're getting, and that doesn't even factor in, you know, the, the clients who, who come and go, which is also a kind of an, an unknown. So, um, I'm not, I'm not really, I'm not really concerned about it. Uh, the other, the other part of this is the state is going to be licensing potentially up to ten other dispensaries throughout the state. So I think that will distribute, 
you know, the uh, demand. It won't all be coming here. Uh, so um, depending on, but we don't have any say over where those are. It's crowded so. at South Windsor. It may not be crowded after more of these go in. I heard the Hartford location isn't yeah, very busy at all, many, so yeah. Many, many medical conditions to the list. You almost see yeah, I'm, two more of them every four I'm, months. I'm assuming consumer protection is, is hopefully looking at this, you know, to distribute the demographics and out to cover the state as best they can, so. Um, and you can f feel that they can, as he said, adjust their schedules and clientele to help with the parking situation, because where else would they park, is that correct? Uh, not to interrupt the discussion, but as part of the, a part of the security review, it was also discussed that the administrating staff doesn't have to actually be located on premises. So with regards to bookkeeping and other, uh, other requirements, those individuals could actually be located at a different office location. Only people that would be required to actually function, the actual dispensing process would have to be on staff. So that would be someone to conduct the security review as the people are coming on, and then the pharmacy techs and the pharmacy, mm -hmm. and then a manager on site. But with regard to those six other individuals, it would be nice to have them on site, but as part of the security review, it was also considered that if that was an issue, then those individuals could actually be located so you elsewhere. Can't, you can't adjust We could definitely 100% adjust. Yes. Accommodate the parking problems if you have them. Well, if it becomes an issue, then you would remove the administrative staff and you would put them somewhere else. That's all via computer okay. system, so bookkeeping and that sort of thing would be done gotcha. at a different location. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. One, one other comment with regards to parking. I'd note that uh, the, the, this facility is on uh, bus routes, so people don't necessarily have to come to the facility you know, by using their own motor vehicle, they could come uh, using you know, mass transit such as the, uh, such as the uh, Connecticut Transit buses. Right. So you're prepared to close the hearing? Should, should you, it's stand up so we got, she's recording it, so. Uh. John, I again from 40 Bird Road. In my experience of going to the Hartford facility, there have been a few occasions of loiterers hovering around the door who didn't have a card that was allowing them in. Not all the time. Most of the times I've gone, I've been there about 10 times, and I'd say two of the times I went there, there was two individuals one time and another time, but they were hovering around waiting, and it was a little bit uncomfortable. So it can happen. I'm not saying it's frequent, but just saying, since you did bring it up before, I wasn't even going to say anything about it. I'm just saying, since you brought it up before, it, 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 you know, there is some occasion where somebody might be loitering around for that. It's not like they're not going to be there. And then you're right, most of the people there are, are have medical needs, like the doctor was saying. They're not going to be the problem people. It just occasionally you have somebody, and I don't know why, they decide maybe they think it's a good idea to hang around the door and maybe they'll get something. I don't know what they think. You know? But that happened in Hartford, so that's what I wanted to say. Just Thank you. Um, uh, Jim Sakonchik with a different hat. Uh, my family does have shopping centers. And we have learned that under state law on private property, it is not discrimination to go to any individual and tell them they are no longer allowed to step on the property. An advantage when you have a self-contained site like this with one owner, he now has that power to say this disruptive individual, uh, you know, um, you can't come back. Talk to the police department. We've gone through this procedure. Uh, the policeman notifies the individual, you know, his first warning, he cannot return. And if he steps on the property, there is a penalty to be paid. He, he's basically handcuffed and arrested. Very effective in, in a way of indicating to that individual that there is a line that's been drawn and he is not allowed in. Now that can't be compared where you have a, a facility with a door right from a public street because that is public, but that's not the situation we have here. We have a private owner <clears throat> and he has that power and rights. Thank you. In, in terms of parking, I think we're looking at this backwards. You know, we're saying, well, we can just continue to add more pharmacists to see more patients. 
I think we want to do reverse because the more pharmacists will see more patients. I mean, this is the business. I think we want to limit the pharmacist, to limit the number of patients, to limit the traffic based on what this site could handle. And I'm not sure I got a, a good answer, at least to my understanding of what that number is for traffic. Again, if we add 10 pharmacists, those pharmacists will see X number of patients every day because obviously it's a business. And then my second, uh, I guess, question to the staffing is, if this business does well and we continue to expand it, will the applicant have to come back to this uh, board for additional uh, applications? So to answer the latter part of your question, that's dependent upon how you want to uh, approve it. So if you wanted to establish a limit on pharmacists and support staff, uh, et cetera, uh, and they wanted to change that, they would have to come back through the process. So it, once again, it depends on what the, what the final outcome and how you want to handle that. Thank you. You know, honestly, I guess I thought you were asking the question if they were to expand to the point where they wanted to double their footprint. Right. It's quite possible. Right. And, and that, would, that, that would definitely, definitely require, right, that, yep. this is a special permit. Yes, so and there's a, spe a specific plan that you're approving with certain square footage, so. Okay. So do we know how many pharmacists this application is requesting? Is that clear? Is that clear to me so far? So. It's an unknown at this point. We're going to start off with one to two pharmacists, and we're going to grow into the business. We may stay with one to two pharmacists indefinitely. I know that speaking from experience in the bakery business, if I have two girls behind the counter and one girl answers the phone, a line starts to build and people start to wait. If I have a third girl working and one girl answers the phone, the line keeps moving. So yes and no, you, you, turn, over, you turn over more, more heads with more staff. On a busy day during the holiday season, say like uh, Christmas Eve, and I have nine or ten girls behind the counter. They'll they'll push a thousand people through the doors. People don't wait. If you have two less girls, you'll have you, you have a line out the door, and there'll be multiple more cars in the parking lot. In fact, when if during the, if it's really busy, or it's, it it should be really busy, and there's too much staff, I I some, sometimes send someone home to build to build to build a line. But that wouldn't happen because this, you, these are patients who can't be on their feet. They can't stand. They're, they're not capable. Some of them are in, in, they're here for pain treatment. They want to be seen and, and let through the doors. So to limit the number of pharmacists, we can, we can arbitrarily throw a number there without knowing is that per, per step, per shift, or practitioners in general. But on a six-day six work week, you'll have one to two full-time pharmacists. You may have part-time pharmacists that work a, a day or two. So you're not going to have that much staff at any given one time. I honestly don't see, I was, when we laid out the store, I spoke to a fellow who, who owns a, a dispensary, and he told me that they're doing all of their, all of their um, clerical work off-site. They actually leased additional space elsewhere to expand the footprint of their, of their pharmacy, the dispensary itself. So when we, when we, uh, my plan to start the business would have a receptionist who would, who would work as a clerical bookkeeper to begin, we would have a pharmacist, an assistant pharmacist, and then we'll have a pharmacy technician to assist in their day-to-day -day operations. We do have to cover six days a week. In the event that the pharmacist is ill, the business, the, the dispensary cannot operate. Mm -hmm. So you'll need, you'll, need a, you'll need redundancy in pharmacy. The pharmacist may or may not need a technician, depending on how, I, 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 when we first start the business, I don't think foresee the business being able to afford to have that much staff. So, so if the commission were to choose to um, apply limits, what but you're probably talking about is per shift, right? Per at, shift. No, at no one time would there be more than X, right? The other way to do it, perhaps, is to put a uh, renewal um, condition on to come back to the commission after a period of time, whether it be one year, two years, uh, to review, to, to make sure that the... Um, the traffic level is not exceeding what our expectations are as a commission sitting here today. So I, I guess I'm thinking it's a pretty big investment. You wouldn't really want to, you really wouldn't want to consider cutting them back. I can, I can see your point if you want to have them go beyond what they've, what we've given them, if we constrain them to begin with, right? Um, and if you want more, you'll have to come back and we can, you know, then you have a certain number of employees, but to exceed that, they would have to come back. Right, right. right. And if I could 
looking at that same floor plan, I guess just to so make sure I understand it. So the, I understand the receptionist is in the lower right corner. Lower is the right actual hand. work area for the pharmacist to fill the prescriptions is in the back? In the back right. And that's where you're saying you might have two? We're projecting two to start, one to two to start. And then when they meet with and patients, they, they come where it says client consulting? The pharmacist will meet with a will consult the patient in the consultation cubicles, which is an area where the pharmacist will have privacy with their, with their patient to describe what they will need, what they might need in different applications of the product. This area here would be used in the, in the event or when they're meeting with new patients or, or patients who would like to talk about treatments and other products and privacy. This area here is six workstations for office staff, on a day-to-day -day basis. That's more the clerical and the bookkeeping? Clerical, bookkeeping, payroll. And where would, the, where would the technicians be in the back as well? The second, yeah. This, this is the, our vault area is in the rear. This will be, this, if you were going to, like, say, a CVS, right. you'll have a pharmacist, one or two pharmacists working in the behind the counter, and you'll have pharmacy area with technicians in the front, mm -hmm. basically a sales clerk, or someone who would hand and, and take payment. So again, you're saying maybe two pharmacists to start well, and one one would be working per shift, right. and one would be the redundant pharmacist if the pharmacist if the other pharmacist would be a part time pharmacist essentially. If okay. business were to become, if there was a drive and a need, we would bring in two pharmacists. And if you're open nine to seven, which is a ten hour span, does any one pharmacist work the entire ten hours in a row, or is Actually, it broken? Yes, they work. All right, so, but, but again, hypothetically, if you had three pharmacists, one or two could be meeting with new patients when needed and when not, they're in the back working and, and the technicians are in the back working, right? Correct. So I guess a couple thoughts just to add to the, you know, do not to exceed number, you know, could it also be to build in yeah, I guess it's a double-edged sword, but you know, building in some recognition that maybe non-essential personnel ultimately may not be located there if necessary to avoid other impacts. That doesn't mean they're going to load in four more pharmacists to replace the four bookkeepers who left. However, I think we're looking at something that would want to be a, a balance to avoid impacts. It seems from you know from the evidence that I've heard. Uh, that the real concern in terms of numbers of, of people, personnel, and so forth, really has to do with the parking, you know, the parking congestion issue. And it doesn't seem to me to be valuable to limit the number of staff that he, you know, that this this facility would have uh, at any one time. The issue is the number of vehicles. <coughs> that would be parked there that would be owned or controlled by such staff that would be utilizing those, those parking spaces. So I think if we limit the number of uh, you know, employee owned or controlled vehicles that would be parking there at any one time, that to me would seem to be resolve uh, you know, that, that particular congestion issue, whether that's you know, four, six, or eight, or whatever. That'd be the maximum number of parking spaces that would be allowed for employee parking. So it's a reasonable thought, but how would you, how would you enforce it, right? Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, you know. I guess on the, on, the, on the flip side, I'd be interested in hearing what the applicant would have to say regarding the concept of some cap set initially with the understanding that they could come back to us you know when they want to and and possibly even coupled with that we could consider still putting a term of a year or two on it you know just as a as a measure and a report back as to how it's going um again not that not that we're necessarily going to be looking to retract the operation but certainly understand how it's working whether there's adjustments that need to, to be made and uh, thinking clearly prior to any enhancement you know beyond whatever that initial level is to me I'm concerned with the number of pharmacists I think that controls the the number of patients that can be churned through this 
at this facility. And I guess my question is, one pharmacist can see how many patients per day? Rakesh's experience working with Walgreens tells me that they, and a busy pharmacy will have two pharmacists and up to five technicians. There's a realistic number. See how many? Five hundred prescriptions a day. How many? Five hundred a day. Five hundred. Okay. And by the time the state will recognize, like initially when the marijuana approved, there was only six dispensary. As soon as they get big Z, state approved another three. So the volume of the six dispensary initially was 2,000. It went down when the other three added into this new one. And now they're adding another three to 10. So the volume of those existing dispensary will go down too, just to control the volume simultaneously and at the different location. So people don't have to go at one location and get busy that much a month ago after opening a new dispensary. It will be much less traffic wise, as well as by more attraction with the customer, more consultation, more benefit to the both. So it's not like one pharmacy will open with the 10 pharmacies, no. Hardly you will get two. By the time you establish, the state will say, okay, time for another three or two more. Sounding difficult. So what do you think? Have you, uh, I guess I'm wondering whether, you know, if we're going to take this path, we can probably deliberate um, constraints um, ourselves. Um, I guess I would, just, I would just ask the applicant. I mean, if, if we decided that we're most comfortable imposing, you know, some kind of a level not to exceed without coming back to us, are you okay with that concept if that's a way to try to get things moving ahead i think we are capable of doing that yes absolutely and and i get and i'm just going to ask you i mean would you have any thoughts or suggestions in terms of what you think would be a, a reasonable manageable cap to set somehow with employee headcount along those lines that sounds like it's something that uh, you know would be workable for you starting out and in the foreseeable future. How many pharmacists would be projected uh, operations? It's hard to say without knowing the, the volume of business. As we started, we start with the one pharmacies, which will so, be me for that for 10 hours. And the, the flow will gradually go up, which will be no day-to-day -day activity with the process that, okay, time for having a backup. So I would say 2,000 will be the maximum with two pharmacies. That should be more than enough. Two, two pharmacies per shift, right? We're, we're talking about per shift, right? That's how. That's the only way we're going to meaning at any given at any time. time two right? pharmacists yeah, and how many technicians? Not, not from day one. After six months, I'm just right. Telling, but yeah. How many uh, technicians would go with those two pharmacists? Two two technicians for each pharmacist. So that way, one will be receptionist, one at the counter, and one will be helping at the back door. So that's six, and then you've got your receptionist is seven. No, 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 no. no. Two pharmacists, four altogether, six. Four technicians. Right, and then the receptionist is seven. Receptionist is seven, yeah. And then, and, and at the beginning, would you even be having any bookkeeping or clerical function in addition to the receptionist, or no? Uh, not right now. Would you come up? She can't take notes. What, what, what's the square footage of the space again? Just short of 1,200. Just short of 2,400. And what's our, I, I realize we've talked about whether it's relevant or not, but what's for this type of retail space? What's Five our, per thousand. So for every 200? Uh, One for 200. Would you, would you deduct the back 12. house from that as well? 12. 12. 12 spots. Gro gross floor area. Would you deduct the, the vault out of that? 2,800 divided Gross floor area. 250 or 200. Five per thousand. I heard five per thousand. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 2,000. And 10. So it's like 12 10, or 12, 13 spots. 12, 12, 13. So I, I don't know. I'm just picking a number out of a hat here. What, what if there were something that said the total number of staff, pharmacists, technicians, receptionists, whoever, shall not exceed eight absent further approval from this commission and amendment to the permit. Does that, does that work? I think so. Would that be at any one time yes. or in aggregate through the day? At any one 
time, I believe, time. is what we're talking about. I'd like to see it limit the number of pharmacists again. I think that really controls the number of patients as well. Well, it both controls it, but also lowers it. it correct. Um, I think you said respectfully that the, the issue of re restricting the number of pharmacies. I I don't know how that would impact what the state licensing would be with respect to being able to service the customer base. You know, when they're issuing their license. I mean, I understand the restriction for looking at the parking spaces, but uh, I'm curious as to if you can turn around and say, I mean, you can do anything you, you wish with, with, with restrictions, but actually limiting the number of pharmacists that would then impact how that license is implemented on a state level is, is uh, and I think it has to be, uh, again, it has to be stressed that yeah. Um, we're looking at the number of, uh, are you looking at concurrent employees on premises at the time? Yes. Yeah. Right. But per I guess, shift. But and, and, and respectfully, the, the, the pharmacists, I, I, I had some experience because I'm a fraud investigator. I was a fraud investigator when we met life. Um, and we used to uh, manage the disability policy for CVS. And part of the requirement was that these, the pharmacist was on staff for 12 hours. That was their shift was 12 hours and they had to stand for the 12 hour period. So when the, yeah, it, it, was, it was pretty tough actually. So anytime you had a pharmacist that had an, a back injury or something, they were basically non-employable at that point. Yeah, and I guess I'm, I'm just listening to how they've described things. I guess I'm, I mean, I agree. I don't know that we should try to become the micro right. managers of the business. And I guess it seems to me if they end up having four pharmacists, then they can only have four technicians they can't have eight there's a there's a critical mass if you say it's eight people or however that they can't exceed they've only got that no, to work normally with. i agree with you when right. you come in here and you have good proposals this one i think we're getting too much into the private business end of it uh, I right. and, I, and i guess i'm what you just were saying yeah so i guess I'm, so my inclination would be just pick business, a single number employees not to exceed at any one and, time and if that's right. the route. They may, they may, the state may not like to see that kind of well, that's but not not pharmacists specifically is what i'm saying just general employees and then if they come back in 18 months and they're in full operation and it hasn't been an issue and they say they want 10 the, or 11. the, 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 the other, other the other thing is that, that, that should be pointed out is um if if the customer experience um is not good in right. terms of if the customer finds that they have a parking issue and it's it, it becomes a it becomes burdensome for them to be able to go to franklin wellness center then it's almost self-regulating and that that patient would then see fit to go to another location that wanted but i believe that you know, with the staffing and the layout of the premises, I believe that uh, we can very well service the customer base, get them in, have them, the, the medication dispensed, and have them back out again. It's at, and there was a question about the, the amount of time that someone spends in a facility. I, this is not not a regular retail environment. It's, you, you, I, I think everybody appreciates that once, once a patient identifies the particular method of delivery of the treatment, then that's what they end up staying with. If that, whether it be an ointment, a chocolate, or some other edible, or whether it be a, a liquid inhaler or something, once they've identified that as being the best means of being able to get the medication, they stay with that and they, they turn up, they pick up, and then they leave. I mean, that's part of the security review we looked at, at, at flow coming into the building, um, how we get people in the building, how we get people back out the building. It's, it was all considered to be able to make sure that we got people in and out as, as, as quickly and as efficiently as possible. It's what, you know, what one other thought I have is if, if they overrun the entire parking lot and use 45 spaces, they're going to start losing banks and other That's tenants, right. right? So do they have some vested interest to control it in a fashion that they don't lose all those tenants because we're only giving them approval for 2,800 square feet, not for the entire shopping center. You know, is that is that going to help? 
a lot of hypothetical. Typically, we've seen many thorough applications where we have a traffic study. We know exactly how many vehicles, at least based on sound engineering. I'm not sure I know how much traffic is coming through. I'll be honest. No, we don't know. It's very hypothetical. I'd like to see something that just a traffic engineer saying, this is what we have, this is what we think it is. At least we can have a, a, a solid vote. Well, and well, I'm confident that, that it'll take, be taken care of. The thing is, though, Commissioner, I think that if we're going to get a traffic study from, from, um, from the business, it's going to be in favor of the business. And we really don't have that much information. Um, I, I think that, that that's just my opinion. I think that there's going to be con information, but I don't know how conducive it's going to be. I do think that there's going to be some flexibility by the business as to how many clients or how many how many patients can come in and out because you'll be able to they'll be able to pick up a prescription within like a three day time. So it is for your benefit to make sure you have adequate parking. Um, I think whether or not you limit the number of um, the number of pharmacies pharmacists how much parking is that going to save one two you know um, they are going to be in and out and I think we don't know I think I I'm not sure if I'm even in favor of this application to be honest with you but if we're talking about parking I would be more comfortable if they if we revisited the whole operation a year later you know and see how it works and see how the flow is and make sure that we have concurrence as to you know how your staffing is and because you yourself said that if you have too many if you have if you don't have enough parking you're willing to take the your payroll people or awesome. your bookkeepers out so you have some some flexibility that way but I, I don't know if we have any any data on dispensary parking that's my thought I was wondering does the state I mean let's put it this way the state's about to make a decision out of 31 I don't know how many applications were but on how many centers to put in. Do, have they actually tracked the use of the centers within the state per hour? And they don't have that information. Okay. There's not much saying, Somehow they're making the a decision, decisions. So someone must you know, know what, who's, like they know how much Harford has, how much Windsor has, for the amount of products that go they out have, the door. They have the number of applicants by county-wise. County-wise only. Each county-wise, how many applicants are there? They are updated every day by the end of the day. The, right. the volume, yeah. I mean, it sounds like part of the problem of trying to do a reliable traffic study is this is an evolving no, industry we don't in there and when they yep. double the number of outlets it's reducing the flow and who knows what those numbers are it's going to grow back again you know that's the right way we but, but i guess as simplistic as i'm thinking I'm, I'm thinking conventional pharmacy rite aid which that parking lot is deserted half the time cvs which is more of a factory i mean if you think about that cvs site even though they do a great prescription business, it doesn't seem that they've got 50 parking spaces filled up at any one time. It's probably 10 or 12 being turned over frequently. And then you've got intense Starbucks and the uh, restaurant that just opened up. I mean, that's an example of a very dense site with multiple dense uses um, overall probably a lot more active than this one will be. And I guess I'm just thinking back, you know, I know that they didn't get a variance for the parking, but I don't recall whether or not we even had a traffic, certainly when we've had new tenants going in as substitutes, I don't think we've done traffic studies. With all due respect, there's a number of existing facilities out there. We know what the square footage is. We know how many pharmacists are on board. We know how many parking spaces they have. We know we can do a traffic count on those in terms of what that, you know, how many vehicles are entering and exiting on an hourly basis. I mean, those are the things we've had a similar studies to this commission uh, for a, just our last uh, study, or last application that we, we approved, where they looked at, you know, similar condominiums. I mean, that's the kind of thorough information. We want to vote. Some of us want to vote in favor of this. We just need that meat that say, this is, this is a sound study, that it's a solid a proposal that we can vote on. At least that's my, my personal opinion. Mm -hmm. So you'd be looking for more information and preferably not shutting the hearing down, which is mm -hmm. kind of what I was getting at before. That's my um, personal, personal opinion. Yeah. So. If everybody else thinks, you know, I, I heard a, an affirmation at the end, but um, if, if, the consensus is that uh, we have enough 
without a formal traffic study, then, then you know, perhaps we should be moving to close the hearing. Mr. Chairman, do you want a non-traffic engineer who's going against several of his colleagues? I have never, I said this to him just a little while ago, I've never seen a traffic study not support an applicant. Uh, it's so. rare. <laughs> I mean, I know you get into controversy on it always, but generally they always support I think that's what Yolanda said 10 Thank minutes ago. <laughs> I got a chuckle out of it. Crazy how I hope it all don't be this. sounded better, though. Definitely sounded more dramatic. And they're expensive. <laughs> I mean, and, and I guess... You know, I guess my thought on it is, you know, it, it's it's not really going to be satisfying regardless of what we get because, you know, it, it's not a traditional retail use. Um, you know, anecdotally, we've heard everything from the places so packed you have to park at McDonald's and drive around in circles to, you know, there's nobody there. And... You know, with respect to the existing tenancies at this site, we've heard from, you know, the range from those are cars are, you know, those 30 cars are there 24 seven to, you know, there's always plenty of spaces. So, you know, it, for lack of a better word, I mean, it's kind of a crapshoot as far as, you know, our best guess as to, you know, and, and their best guess as to, you know, how many people are gonna work there you know, and they're going to take up X spaces, and then, you know, the the number of patients and the turnover and the length of stay, you know, is a wild card. Um, you know, on the one hand, we're hearing that you know when they open up more of these, the ones that exist will be less crowded. But you know, the the whole goal of the program is to grow it to the point where it's you know, self-sustaining, so you're going to add patients to the mix at the same time, you know, you're opening more dispensaries, so it's, you know, the absolute opposite of, you know, free market retail. I mean, it, it's government-controlled oligopoly or whatever, <laughs> you know, as far as how many of these there are and where they're located and how many people can, you know, can go to them. So, I mean, it... I doubt there's an Urban Land Institute number that, you know, you use to figure out how many parking spaces there are here. I guess, you know, we just have to start from the premise that, you know, as, as a standalone retail complex, this has fewer parking spaces than our regulations require and kind of work from there in terms of are we comfortable adding, you know, either a finite or an infinite number on top of that and, you know, as much as I like on the superficial level the idea of revisiting the issue in a year, what do we do in a year? I mean, do we throw the bank out? You know, do we shut down Sherwin-Williams? Do we tell these, you know, um, you know, suffering individuals, you know, maybe, maybe you can go back to Weston Street now because we don't have enough parking spaces here in Hartford, in Wethersfield. It, it's just, it's a problem that I don't see us solving with either keeping the hearing over open or getting more study. All right, thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm not. I'm not sure. Additional study, although you know, obviously, traffic was. I asked the question because traffic was bothering people, but I don't know that I personally believe you're going to get a lot more data to feel comfortable about. But. My opinion. Well, I guess, just remind me, Peter, what, what did you say the requirement was? Uh, five per thousand square foot. For the whole thing, that would be how many? Uh, we, we threw 14,000 14, just for yep. uh, roughly, so 70. 70, and there's 57, so okay. they're getting closer, but. That depends on the use of the store. Like in this case, it's more like a medical office. It's a strip commercial center. We uh, plugged it in all as retail. I mean, it's not all strictly retail, but you know, bank with you know, it's a, it's a hodgepodge. Sher Sherwin Williams is retail. This is classified technically as retail, as a pharmacy would be. So, what's office? Just out of curiosity. I think compared. that depends on the type of office, but it's roughly the same. It is. If it was, if it was. Considered medical office, it would I think be a little bit more six per thousand maybe. Yeah. 
And if you focus on just this, this facility, it's 2,400, you would need 12 spaces, of which we said potentially six or seven. It's 2,800, is that? 2,300. Space is 20, and, and, and it's based on a total gross floor area, the standard? Yes. Sli slightly less than 2,400. It's 2,400 less than the chemical room. He's, he was saying 2,400. 24? 2,400. Talking about a building that points none of us are allowed It's still into. in the low <laughs> teens, 10 to 15. Talking about a store that none of us are allowed into. <clears throat> <laughs> so, so, <laughs> could you stand up and yell at Tom or come up to the microphone? I'm at Rella 600 Walker Hill Road. I have the Cessna cars here. There's two buildings. Uh, there's a building and I see one at 6570 and one at 8650. 15,000. Thank you. That may take the breezeway, that's the open air breezeway into consideration, though. That's the square footage that's listed on the inspection yeah. card. Thank you. Um, What's that? Just uh, like, what are the hours of operations of the other businesses that are in there now? It the, the, uh, depends on the store. Uh, Sherman Williams, I believe, is open 7 a.m. to 7 or 8 p.m., even, maybe even later. Uh, the, um, Key Bank is open. I believe 8 a.m. to 3 and 5 p.m. depending on the day of the week, and then they close on Saturday, uh, close on Sundays, and I think they close at noon on, s on Saturday. Uh, Hangar Prosthetics is open Monday through Friday. I believe they start at 8. I'm not sure, exactly sure, and I don't think I don't think they're past 4:30 there. Hangar, if I believe by appointment only as well. Yeah. The bank has the drive-through, which uh, diverts traffic along uh, Wells Road. Sherman's got the biggest impact is. Definitely first thing in the morning. They may even open at seven. By by nine o'clock, all the most of the, well, I don't say all, but most of the guys when I drop my daughter off at school, I see them. Most of those guys are like loading up and leaving at like 7:45. There's usually vans and, and trucks there backed mm -hmm. up, but then that half of the parking lot's always empty. I don't say always, but mo most of the time empty. It's in the back of my mind throughout this entire parking conversation is that there's only 75 people in Weathersfield that are even allowed to get into this building. And in town, like it's it's this isn't a CVS or a Rite Aid where I can just go in whenever the hell I want. It's it's this is something that is relatively restricted. Sure, it's going to get more or sorry less restricted. I don't know. There's, there's going to cards more cards are going to be issued as as this goes on. But it's not like there's there's people now that have the cards that have a spot that they go to they probably have a pharmacist that they like that they have a report with they're probably just going to keep going there unless it's really way more convenient so i made that number 75 maybe wrong and that's probably what they're whispering about but the there's a, such a small audience of people that are allowed to go in there at this point that talking about it like it's a you know regular retail store I don't know, seems a little moot to me that's the difficult that we have because we don't have the experience um, I don't think you oh. can keep this place open if there are only 75 people that are willing to come to it. <laughs> you know, once a month that was fine. good I'm not a yeah, parking I'm parking not issue resolved no. <laughs> that, Dave, that was a testimony of a Somebody sitting in the audience, right? I live within and, uh, a thousand feet hearing. of this place. Yeah. So sure. But I don't know what, how that was verified. That. Mm -hmm. Oh, I don't know. That was uh, yeah. I, I, I forget. Right. Somebody, somebody said it either at this meeting or the last meeting. Right. But, but. I think she said she knew seventy-five people. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. So. Yeah. So all right, then maybe it's less. So. Before we close, or if we're going to close, is it, do we have to define how many? Uh, employee parking out of the 14 we say seven is there a number out there that uh, we have for the number of employees do we even want to vote on that is it so I, I think we're going to end up having to consider a specific proposal whether there's a restriction on the number of um, employees that can be working there or not or whether it self-regulates or not you know I think all that's going to be fleshed out in a proposal that would be my guess, right? We've heard that the applicant is at least open to it, but we're not really sure how that plays with the state. So maybe the, the generic, if we're gonna regulate it, maybe the generic uh, number of employees is the right way to go if 
if uh, maybe, or just let itself regulate and uh, you know, because so. because you're right. I mean, people are not, somebody said it anyways. People will choose not to come here if they have to circle the darn thing for 15 minutes to find a parking space for something that should take them 30 seconds to get. Right. So, and and maybe they will park across the street behind uh, Max Bebo, but if they're actually hurting, probably not. <laughs> they'll park on Bird. They'll park on. Yeah. Uh, well, I hope not. I live on Somerset Street, so I deal with uh, the Corpus Christi parking. So don't get me started on churches. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so would somebody like to make a motion on the hearing, or we, or do we need more information? That's just one question. What we're seeing here in this packet is a diagram of the center and, you know, the name of the center with a logo saying Medical Cross. We do health care. The question I have is when you present this to the, what are you going to present to the state in the process? Are you going to present a formalized plan with That's taken from our application else? for the state. This is, what you're this is what we submitted to the state as well. Will they at any time be able to tell you it's wrong? Say, say they grant you the right. Will they then go through your design and tell you how to, will this design change? That's the question I'm asking. If they don't like it, they'll reject it. Okay, so they can't take you through the process of, no. you know. They, tell you, they, give, you the, they give you the requirements and the parameters of how they'd like the application drawn up and the, the, the parameters of how they like the, what they'd like for security and monitoring and how they like a vault system. And they tell you hours that you, the max minimum hours you can operate. They tell you that a pharmacist needs to be on duty at all times. The request for bid is very specific. They're, you're asked to submit an application, a thorough application. If your application meets the requirements, they'll accept it. If they doesn't, they'll reject it. Okay, so it's not like this is what they're going to look at and they're going to make a decision on this plan, not on a revised plan. No, no, this is the, that's the plan that we've submitted. Okay, thank you. you know. Move to close the hearing. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Is uh, everybody in favor say aye? Aye. 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 Is there anybody opposed? All right. And I, uh, I'm probably going to do this already, but my, I, might I suggest we figure out which alternates are participating before we... Uh, so, so uh, Dave, thank you. <laughs> Mental block. Dave is, Dave is not participating. Okay. okay. All right. So, uh, would anybody like to try and put a proposal on the table? And, you know, the normal, obviously, is a... Positive proposal is what we prefer to see, and we will act on a positive, positive motion. Anybody like to craft it? I might attempt just for discussion. Well, we can do it collectively. Yeah. Purposes. So I guess it would be, it would be a motion to approve the application. I would suggest that the maximum permitted hours be 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Saturday. In terms of signage, um, I guess not window, but, you know, upper wall, wall, wall signage wall. to me would have to be in compliance with the town regs taking into account all the other signage that's already on that property freestanding signs, whatever, uh, I would suggest that there be no window signage. Peter mentioned that you can do 25% of the windows, and I would suggest that that be prohibited Correct. to zero. Um, I would also suggest that no display of products or goods of any kind themselves be allowed through the windows. Um, I don't think the state allows it. Okay. Does it, yeah. so. um, right. mm -hmm. I think that's true. And uh, in terms of the services and products offered, I assume that has to be in accordance with the state of Connecticut dispensary facility permit, if ultimately granted, as well as in accordance with all applicable state regulations and rules in terms of what products and services they would be allowed to offer. I think that would be a state issue more than us. 
I would include um, repair of the catch basin that's presently cordoned off with cones and plywood such that it's operating and no longer cordoned off. And I would suggest that the concrete curbing at the bank drive-through lane that is currently deteriorated be repaired and or replaced in consultation with town staff. And I, and I guess the catch basin repair in consultation with town staff as well. Um, and I guess I'm really not, I'm not sure at this point in my thinking, maybe this should be discussed in more detail, whether we want to consider an overall employee count or as Tom has indicated, maybe as an alternative to let, let it evolve based on all the different forces and potential checks and balances that are out there. I guess I'm not, I'm not sure where I come out on that. So I don't, I guess if I exclude that for now, I'm certainly open to discussion of that. If that's something that people think we should do, you know, or I guess if people have ideas about coming back in a certain period of time, but maybe I start with uh, what I just said, if that sounds as a start, as like a start. That's fine, and I, th I think uh, if somebody would second it, we'll probably. I'll second. Thank you. Um, we will probably get into that exact point right now. Is is that something that would, you know, be preferable to to people? And we'll just listen to the dialogue and see if we need to change it. Yeah, or I mean, I mean, in some ways, I guess to me it might be helpful to just sort of have some general discussion, just in terms of what do people think about this use? What do they worry about if they're worried about it? And maybe that would play into whether we need to do those kinds of things. And I guess maybe a couple of observations that I would just offer would be, you know, compared to your true pharmacy like a CVS or a Rite Aid, those places are selling all kinds of non-regulated products, over-the-counter stuff, food, cigarettes, um, uh, many, many different things, and many people go in at any given time to those places not getting a prescription but getting something else. So I guess as Including a preliminary... over-the-counter medications. Right. So as a preliminary matter, and again, this is uncharted ground, but we know this facility isn't going to be offering those types of things. So I guess I distinguish it in that sense. And, and I guess I think of uh, you know liquor stores, package stores, which really as a practical matter, have an incredibly low level of regulation in the sense that you need to be 21 to, to buy, but it is a very lightly regulated industry. You know, you don't need a prescription. You walk out the, the door with it, et cetera, et cetera, and there's literally three and a half million or three million or whatever people in the state of Connecticut can, who can go and buy it anywhere. So I, I guess from an impact perspective, isn't it possible that the true overall pharmacy package store, you know, th those two uses potentially could be a higher impact use than this tightly regulated use, it seems to me. So I just throw that into the mix. Mm -hmm. Well, since nobody's talking, I, I you know, I'm going to, I didn't vote for this zone. I, I can't say that I support that we're, you know, we were proposing it in this zone. You know, I know why we didn't put the residential setback. Um, it just wasn't going to work with this particular location in the first place. But it was never something I, you know, wanted to do. So uh, I'm, I'm going to be hard pressed to be voting for any proposal, even though I think in general this. You know, except for the traffic concerns, you can certainly argue this is within the parameters we set, right? So, you know, all things considered, this is certainly approvable, right? Um, but, um, you know, I didn't, I didn't approve the zone in the first place. I'm struggling from that perspective. So, so my thought, um, I wish I went first because <laughs> I have, I pretty much had the same sentiments um, I, I think that 
if this was a location where we had to have a medicinal dispensary, I think the the people that are in charge of it and the choices they've made, I think, are, are very good and very competent. But, but I think that there's other uses for that location besides a dispensary. I think the fact that it's in the town center, I'm thinking about the Weathersfield Conservation Plan, proximity to, to neighbors. And you know, I do feel much more comfortable having a dispensary in town. I truly am. I don't have that stigma like I, I didn't associate it with a stigma like I did a month ago. But I, I just, for some reason, I, I have concerns that it is close to, to the neighborhoods. And it, it, it kind of bothers me that other dispensaries and other neighboring towns are in more industrial zones. On one hand, I think having a, a location that's, that's open, that people, people who have this need, um, you know, they could just go into town, pick up what, what helps them, and then leave. It's much more convenient for them. But I think for those limited individuals, there's a whole other group, which is a very densely populated neighborhood surrounding that area. And I think that after listening and, and really trying to keep an open mind and researching prior to the meeting, um, I still have this position that I would decline this ap application. That's my thought. You know, before everybody else speaks, I, I agree with what you just said. That with every time I every time I talk about this, I become less and less, you know, put standoffish with the topic. I still just don't agree that this is, you know, where I wanted it. Right. Right. We have adopted a regulation, and basically, the regulation that we adopted is for this particular site. Let's be realistic. This is what was in mind when the regulation was adopted. It's not going to fit any place else. If we adopted a regulation which said a thousand feet from a residence, there would be a zone out in the town of Weathersfield. I have not done uh, an engineering study, but I would be very much surprised if there are any locations within the town of Weathersfield that would exist that would meet. Uh, the regulations and be a thousand feet from a residence. We do not have industrial areas. This is Weathersfield. I see that there's a need for this particular type of use. I think the connotation we all agree is not what it may have been when the when the topic first came up. I understand where it is. I do. I, contrary. I don't believe it's contrary to the plan of. Uh, plan of development. I really don't. If you look at the plan of development, there's nothing in there which would specifically refer to this, and this, uh, this particular use would be uh, in violation or be against anything within the plan of, uh, the plan of development. I really don't. Um, I think it's a benefit where there are patients who need this. Uh, it is unfair for patients who are living in Weathersfield in the Weathersfield area to have to travel to other areas to be able to take advantage of this new science. I think it's a growing science and I think we're doing the residents of Weathersfield a disservice if we don't be able to adopt a location for a dispensary in the town. We adopted the regulation, we have to live with the regulation. And because of the regulation that we adopted, I think this, this site it would be beneficial for that purpose. My thoughts dovetail with what Dan has just uh, stated, and um, uh, I think the, the issue relative to the future is whether or not we wound up amending the regulation to expand you know, to other sites, but I don't think that you're going to find uh, a, a, quote, perfect site in Weathersfield given the, the, the way the town is configured and its current uh, level of occupancy. Um, you know, you've only got a very few places or areas within the town where uh, such a facility is really, uh, you know, both, uh, uh, you know, commercially and economically viable and fitting within the general nature of our, our current zoning regulations. So, um, and I also 
tend to feel that, well, from my experience in developing uh, multiple facilities for people with disabilities that have run into very similar kinds of concerns and uh, outcries from the public at various meetings and the like, uh, having locating a, f a facility of this nature in, in essentially a, a, a retail environment causes far less uh, sense of deviancy on the part of those that are going to be utilizing this facility than, say, locating this facility in, a, in an industrial zone, um, which, uh, you know, uh, has implications of, of a less desirable clientele, so to speak. So uh, I, I tend to favor uh, myself uh, uh, this application. While not, not perfect, I, I don't see it conflicting with either the plan of conservation nor the, the regulations uh, that, uh, uh, that we have adopted for the, the town of Wethersfield regarding uh, the uses of, of real estate within the town. Yeah, uh, I don't agree with either of my colleagues here. Uh, Dan makes a good point uh, that uh, there aren't many locations in town that we could love put this, and the town planner backs that up. But I think you can make some changes in a nearby area or have a minimum distance to residences. Um, doesn't have to be 500 feet, doesn't have to be you know, it could be even as much as 100. But the point is that uh, we've had difficulties even up in discussing the North End one at, uh, there several years ago that it was backed up right to residences in that area. And I think the same thing goes here. In fact, these residences uh, couldn't be any closer to this without being on top of the building. That's how close that wall is to the first residence on uh, Bird Road. Um, I don't. I don't agree with Dan in the sense that it, that meets. It does meet. Doesn't meet the plan of development as far as this new zone on the Silas Dean, and and the three areas that I think has been, have been brought out uh, prior to this. Um, but my big my big uh, one one other thing I want to discuss. Newington is seriously considering such a facility and. What kind? I actually went and looked at it. It, it and I know others here have too. Um, it's located in a commercial area I didn't know existed, and it's practically in in our town. It's so close to it. That in fact, I think the building, brand new medical facility, you come in from on a one lane road along the prop the town line to get to it, and then you go out onto the Berlin Turnpike. Uh, that's the only inconvenient thing, a beautiful structure with uh, several medical operations in there already. And uh, that's probably only two or two and a half miles from our Silas Dean. But again, it rep represents the whole western half of town, too. There are a lot of people out there. And it's not just the Silas Dean orient orientation that it has to be. Um, and then, and really, my big concern is, again, once more, I might have said it already, but it's how close it is to the residences behind it and the uh, fragrance from the marijuana issue, which is real. And uh, that, there was some testimony on that again tonight. I don't think it's conducive to the neighborhood. And that's one of the reasons you have, probably should have it away some distances I just indicated from residences, wherever it is in town. Those are my thoughts. Thank you. So if I'll jump in, the I'm within the thousand feet of this, and I'm going to check my mail pile, but I don't remember getting the notification. But anyway, the um, obviously I got the larger packet notification that we got. The in terms of like the we we say there's no stigma or whatever, but these. The, the folks that are going to these places, they're not going because they want it, right? They're going because they need it. They're going for a medication. It's not a drug that used to be the sched same schedule as heroin in the 70s, right? Like it's, 
that's the stigma that this product is fighting. And so when people say, not in my neighborhood, et cetera, like I understand that there are homes that are very close to it, but what kind of activity do you think is going on? Like it's, they're going in. I, my daughter live, will live in this neighborhood and will be able to walk by. She, there's no way she gets in it. And there's no way that somebody coming out of a medical facility getting something that they need is going to like absentmindedly drop it on the sidewalk. So I mean, you would have the same, you should have the same concern about the right aid that is a couple hundred feet from the church because you're going in, getting, a pharma, getting something from the pharmacy. If you go in and you get something from a pharmacy, you need that product. You're not being careless and stupid and a, like a pothead about it, right? Like that's, that's the, the stigma that follows this. And it's, it's funny because it is funny. But it's true, it, and because everybody says, like, this is not what I want in my neighborhood. What, you don't want a facility that gives people the medication that they need to make their lives better? We have a testimony that somebody says it saved their friend's life. I have people who, I know people who have taken opioid for extended periods of time, and it has significantly reduced their quality of life. And I keep trying to talk a couple people into trying this and they just refuse because it's just this thing that they can't get past. So I mean, when you talk about this not fitting with the neighborhood, it's it's an old mentality and it's a mentality that's going to be changing very quickly. And it's we're only having this discussion is because we're pretty early on in the process. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know, that's my thing. So should we be? Yes, indeed. Tony, Tony J. Did you second the motion? I did second the motion. So it's going to come down to the wire. Should we be talking about the specifics of it? Well, I guess does well, it might be interesting of the people who have I guess both you know both groups of people those who have said they favor the use. I'm not sure if any of them Are feel that we should be doing these. And I guess as to the others who've expressed reservations, would imposing conditions like that make any of them feel more comfortable such that they might be disposed to support it at that point, right? Um, so not everybody has spoken. I, I don't know how this is gonna go down. It seems pretty evenly split at the moment. Um, so. I mean, I don't know. <clears throat> I mean, I'm I'm still on the fence because I know that you know that, or at least I I think I understand that this, this is an evolving thing. And like I said, every time I talk about it, you know, it it gets to be less and less of an issue. It's it's less about the neighborhood to to um, um, to Ryan's point about it being not right for the neighborhood. It's more about. Um, the town center was supposed to be a walkable type thing, and, we, and yet we're putting a high density. But, but would we be having the same? Would I be personally having the same struggle if it was a CVS that was being proposed? And I'd probably be going along with it just because, you know, okay, what, what control do we really have on it? It's still the property owner's, you know, choice to do something, and it's not what we hope for. But, you know, we would probably approve it, right? So um, I am struggling with that in my own head, right? It's it's not it's it's less about the stigma and more about the fact that it's not really what we want in terms of a walkable community. I mean, on your other question, I mean, it seems like there's two ways to go if you want to do something, and we've we've done. I mean, the route we've taken on some other special permit applications is sometimes we have imposed a term of years, and whether that has the potential for difficult issues down the road if we determine that there are. Problems and how do we deal with them is a, you know, is certainly a debatable point. But we have done that in certain instances, and I think that's an option here to just say, as I think Yolanda had suggested at one point, whether it's a year or two years or whatever, you know, we're we're putting a term of years on it, and they shall come back and apply for renewal at that point. Um, I don't know if we specifically asked the applicant 
his opinion on that aspect. We did, you know, on the other, which is to just say not to exceed X number of employees at any one time on the premises. And I guess, you know, on, on one hand, I think to try to set a number of employees is inherently difficult and we're not running this business and are we getting too much in, I mean, in some ways I like the just come back in a year or two, but I guess the downside is what do you do with what, it? What do we all do at that point if there's an issue? Right. You know, may, maybe what you do is you try to work with the applicant to find things that they can do to alleviate the issues that have arisen without telling them that they can't have the use anymore. And whether you could strike a balance or an agreement on that, who knows if it happens, how it happens. and what the issue is, but um, I think those are the two choices if we want to do something. So I don't know if people are inclined to want to do something, and if so, if either one of those sounds like the better way to go. Um, again, uh, I, I don't know if it's that that particular issue is going to sway my thoughts on it. I, it's almost ancillary to my thinking. Um, and, and, and regardless of whether it sways anybody thoughts, and again, I don't know how this is going to go, but if it ended up being an approval, I guess whether you're voting for it or against it, do people think it's a good idea to have one of those two things as part of it? Right. So, I mean, I, I think there's only two options, and that is cons constrain the total number of employees, and and we can't enforce it, but we know that intuitively if they're following it they're probably constraining the volume of traffic that can use the place if they're being if they're doing it right um, and i suppose we could always audit it but you know it's probably not reasonable but it's at least something and the only way to change it would be to come back to us right and then we can consider increasing it if things are working fine the other alternative to just let it go and think that a year from now we're going to have a dialogue that's a, you know, well, you that whether you, what you call an open-ended review, sort of. And I, but and you know, I don't see us adding any constraints. So it's just a dialogue, and you know, it's, right. Uh, you know, and I suppose if you did the if you did the eight, you know, people version, and it was clear that to exceed that they mm -hmm. have to come back, you know, I, hypothetically, could you also build in a report back? regardless of whether they want to exceed that so we at least have an opportunity to still have a discussion with them as to how it's going even if they don't need more than eight you know maybe you could do that yep and i i don't know now that we're talking that i i kind of am, am tipping slightly in the balance on trying to craft something that can work for everybody rather than just have it done conditionless Right. And that's the end of it. So, and so I struggle, you know. So, so when it, when push comes to shove, I I can't really sit here and say that I hope it fails, right? Because we put this in place, and we all knew the people that voted for it knew where this was going to be proposed. So I'm, mm -hmm. I I don't understand why it's as close as it seems to be playing out right now, right? Um, so, you know, I. I'm, I'm kind of hoping it doesn't fail, but I still want to be able to vote no, right? Because that's generally where I started. Um, but I think if you're going to put constraints on it, the, the second option where you just constrain the number and, and maybe you throw on a, you know, a, a status report a year from now is, you know, would, would, it would be the preferable way to do it. And, and, and I, I think that makes sense as well. And you got eight? Happy to do it. I, I would add... Right, I guess I would add that uh, the condition would be that the total number of employees on premises at any given time, regardless of their title, role, or job description, shall not exceed eight absent uh, return to this commission to seek an amendment to the permit to allow a higher number and in addition, that we would ask them, regardless of whether they're seeking to expand the eight to come back within one year following the commencement of operations so that we can have a, a discussion in terms of, of, of how things are going and whether there are any uh, 
with, with there, there's the need to discuss any type any of parameters. potential adjustments or whatever. Right. So I, I would add that to the motion. Mm -hmm. I'll second that. Yeah. Of of the of the actual amendment, I think the really crucial thing is the report that we would be seeking the the re review because we we really are um, uh, making a decision somewhat in a vacuum of not having that kind of utilization data that uh, you know that that we can think of it, uh, that we can actually use to predict the volume of traffic the volume you know the the overall impact on the side of this particular kind of business yep. we're just we're just winging it and, yeah. and i guess yep. you know but it's something to bring but, uh, but i think it you know having that being armed with that would be you know Helpful to us in the future, helpful to other communities in the future. And, and, and I data. And, and thank you, Tom. And I guess the, you know, as a practical matter, I guess if there's a cap of eight that they can't exceed without our permission, if we don't grant that permission, then eight is it, right? If if it's determined later that you know any more than eight is going to be problematic in terms of the parking field. Yeah, unless they litigate the matter and you know they turn out that we, you know hmm? we're we're legally. A, you know, beyond our authority in setting such limits, but I'm not opposed to establishing that uh, that criteria. Well, and I'm and I'm focused on the fact that the applicant said that they were agreeable to that, so we haven't sprung that on them out of the blue. It was discussed, and and they said they were okay with it. Do you consider that amendment or modification to be integral to your original motion? <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure I understand what you're asking, Rich, in terms of would I still would, support it without that amendment? Yeah. I'm open to discussion and hearing whatever viewpoints are out there on the no, issue. I, I mean, I'm, I'm open to being uh, swayed if other people have other ideas. No, I mean, I, I, I'm not going to argue about whether that addition is a good idea or a bad idea because I think a lot of people think it's a good idea. It's just, you know, I think it is part of our, part of our motion, part of the, you know, thought process that goes into, oh, you know, and the, if it, if it is approved, it is, you know, I see because of the whole package of conditions, including those. That it wasn't just sort of a gratuitous right. throw in, but that that's what made us comfortable to, right. to get to our decision. Yes. Yes. If it's okay. in and as I've expressed it so far, I would say yes. Okay. It that, is. That's what I was asking. Okay. I have a question, Mr. Chin. Joe, what, what happens if something comes up that's not that part of that condition? We could still review it. At that point, the additional stuff, right? Um, Go sorry, back so at any time. So you mean the, the year out review, George? Is that what you're? Yeah, I'm wondering to? if you're just limiting it to that one condition, and I there guess might be other no. things that come up. No, I, I don't think that, so. At, I, a year from now, or whenever. No, I don't think so. I mean, if you know, if they have eight employees, but the volume of patients is such that you know people are double parked on the Silas right. Dean. You know, then I think it's legitimate to evaluate that. Or if, you know, there have been, you know, repeated complaints of loitering or but he, something like you're that. You're making this motion because of the original point of parking. Right? That was my and, driver that concerned. But I'm trying to say there could be something else that comes up. I That's agree, and I, and I agree with what Rich just said, George. So I think the eight is a, at least a tangible thing that they as know. As you have something for them to come back. But as to the rest of it. You can deal with other stuff. Right, and I think okay, part, and the fine. way I tried to phrase it, hopefully it was clear, is that a year of operations out, it's a they review. come back for a general discussion of how things are going, and we can have that discussion with them, and if we think there's adjustments that are needed, we can discuss that with them. Not limited to number of employees or or, or even parking necessary. I think that's a good compromise uh, for acceptance of a, 
uh, a use which I think is important for the town. And um, if we can gain a consensus of this board, I certainly in favor of it. I think it's limiting, but I'd, I'd be in favor of it to reach a consensus. But I, and I think, and I think too, the other thing about coming back within a year, you get a chance to hear back from the neighbors in the area too, to hear how is it going from their perspective. All right. Should we take a vote? Call the question. All right. So we have. Is the motion clear enough in everybody's mind? And okay, we don't have to is summarize it, it. And I was going to say, did this whoever seconded? Did you did. second the amendment as well? I second did. the amendment. Okay. Move the question, Mr. Chairman. All right. All right. All those in favor of the? We'll raise our, I'm sorry. Should we raise our hands? Uh, yeah, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. All those in favor, uh, please signify by saying aye and raise your hand. Aye. 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 One, two, three, four, five. Okay, and those opposed, raise your hand and say nay, nay, nay. right? <clears throat> and you can, you know who it did? All right, it passes five to four. Congratulations. Congratulations, good luck. <laughs> All right, we have minutes. Uh, make a motion minute. to approve, Mr. Chairman. Excellent job on those minutes. That's what I heard earlier. Okay. So yeah. do we, I'm sure we have enough bodies here, but obviously only those that were present. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. My goodness. At nine. <clears throat> At nine people who were present last time, I'm not. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Uh, other orders of business here? Do we have anything else? That's it? All right. Pending applications? Do we need to talk about it at all? Uh, we received two additional applications today, um, which will be heard at your next meeting. So you do have a couple things coming up. So. All right. All right. Anybody want to make a motion? So this one's the one that's listed at the next meeting. No, I don't think it's going to the regulation amendment. We won't be at the next meeting. Yeah, it's a, a regulation amendment. So. June 5th. Are they controversial things like sheds? <laughs> <laughs> like uh, 850 square foot garages? Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> one is the town's salt storage shed down at the garage. Oh, I'm going hard on that one. So. Uh, motion, please. Anybody want to make a motion to go home? Yeah. I make a motion. Yep. So I'll move, please. Second. All, right. All those in favor say aye. Aye. <laughs> aye. 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 Most, I had most of them, but there were a couple in there that we didn't have. So, if you can do that, that would be like, I